Thanks. Uh, so today I want to, the aim is one, to uh, show you how some of the internals of the library work and how you can use it to build useful things like simulations and stuff like that. But also uh, I would like to discuss uh, more about the why of doing some of these things. We leave it out. Most of my slides, if you looked online, I put them online earlier, what you see is most of it is about the how. How do I accomplish something? How do I use this solver? How do I code this up? I have a thing, I want to do it. But even more interesting most times is why. And I, I really enjoyed uh, Keyes' lecture before me, so I'll give you an example of the way I think about why for some of these computational things that you can use Petsy to do. So for instance, why would you use a Krelov solver? Right? So my answer, I think, would be a little bit different. Uh, the Krelov solver, you saw the convergence rate, right? So the convergence rate says something like it can, uh, it's square root of uh, condition number. And so for the, the problem that he wrote as the example problem, the condition number goes like h squared. So, you know, the number of iterates that you're going to have to convergence is something like h. So the bigger the problem gets, the more iterates you're going to have, no matter which one of the methods you use that was on the board, right? So asymptotically, you make no progress. So uh, my answer to why I always use Krelov methods is different, because the way I think about it, you start out with something that will give you, say, oh, one iterates. So for the model problem over there, you would say, oh, I'm going to use multigrid. Um, and multigrid is just about perfect for that problem with no coefficient, but none of us have problems like that, that are linear and constant coefficient. So what if you have a coefficient, what happens? And what happens is uh, you have to solve the problem a little bit on every level. You have a smoother, and that demands that you have a very good idea of the spectrum of your operator. Well, we know the spectrum exactly for the model problem, but for problems that you typically get in practice, you don't know the spectrum exactly, right? So what happens is that you will code up a multigrid method and it will not work, okay? And then people get frustrated and they say, this doesn't work at all, I will use a method that's not necessarily scalable, but will work, right? And we'd like to think of it from a slightly different perspective, I think. So the way I would think of it is, the reason to use Krelov methods is that they are spectrally adaptive. We saw that with what with the proof today is that we're talking about clustering eigenvalues, we're talking about making a polynomial that is small on the spectrum, and it can do that adaptively no matter what the spectrum is. So if my smoother stinks a little bit for some part of the spectrum, or if my coarse grid operator is inaccurate for some part of the spectrum, then Krelov methods can clean that up. And so if I take my non-working multigrid method, wrap it in a Krelov accelerator, it's very robust. And so my answer to why would you would use a Krelov method follows that kind of logic. And you can test this out. You can do things in Petsy like code up elasticity. There's an algebraic multigrid method in Petsy. And you can say, OK, I'm going to use algebraic multigrid, but I'm going to feed it a slightly truncated thing. So I won't give it all of the near null modes. I won't give it three rotations and three translations. I'll subtract out a rotation uh, for the coarse grid. And what that'll do is it, it won't work. Uh, it'll fail to converge. But if you wrap a Krelov method around it, it will find that missing rotational mode, and the, the whole thing will converge. And this is how I think we should think about these methods, is you want, you want to know enough about the method to know why it works. You don't have to be able to code it yourself. It's sort of the analog of, I know why my lab equipment works. I know why a lock-in amplifier can, can uh, get one frequency. But I don't know how to build a lock-in. So you don't have to build these methods yourself, but you do have to know why they work so that you can know when to use them and make good computational decisions like that. So I work on Petsy, uh, which is, I think, 
a pretty unique collaboration. It's a group, a small group of people that work together to build a lasting software artifact, which is kind of rare. And the reason I work in Petsy is I strongly believe this. Don't believe any computational claim unless you can execute it yourself. I don't believe anything people write in papers at all. And I don't think experimentalists, for the most part, believe what's published either, unless they can do it in the lab. And Petsy is designed so that you can verify the claims of other people. If someone says, for this problem, I used this solver and it worked, if you can't reproduce that solver, it's not a very useful claim in my view. And so Petsy is designed to allow you to easily build the solvers that other people claim work and test them. Or maybe build the solver that you think will work. So, as I said, it's a fairly small group of people. This, these are the main people that have worked on Petsy in the past year, although I've left out Dave May and Patrick Sanan, who contributed a really nice thing like a month ago. Um, so if you want to see the whole list, you can see here are the old people. So I'm in the old list. I used to be in the young person list. It's very sad. Uh, but here, and this is sort of a timeline. So Petsy's pretty old. It's old enough to drink in the US. And you can see that we have pretty long running participation. And, but also, there are a lot of new contributors uh, that have just started, so it is a dynamic project. And it's not quite of the size of an Apache or something like that, but we do have about 100 people a year contribute code, check it into the repository. So the point of this exercise is that I show you how to do some elementary and some not so elementary things. Um, but you should also feel free to give me feedback, because without you telling me I'm interested in this problem or asking a question like, how do you solve the Hemholtz equation? <laughs> what is your view? Or asking me, should we be running on GPUs? Or is my code going to be OK on KNL? You know, none of these have definitive answers, but they're all good questions. You know, and how you address it says something about how you approach computational science. So I think all those questions are interesting. So feel free to ask what you are wondering about. Don't think you have to have a question like, what does this specific method do? You can have an open-ended question, and I will probably be more interested than that. Again, ask questions. Um, so uh, there are more slides than I have time for. And the reason is, I think they could be useful, so I put them in. But I'm not going to talk about everything. And I'm not, I'm not going to read this stuff off the slides either, because I find that really annoying when I'm in the audience. I'm going to say what I think is important. And I'm not going to go over the slides here about installation, because we did it yesterday. But if anyone has an installation question, go ahead and ask me while I'm going through it. I will just do an introduction. So, Petsy is not a comsol or an abacus or something of that nature where you're intended to solve a certain set of problems and you have a top level view that says, I'm interested in this problem. Rather, it's a set of libraries uh, that contain numerical methods that can be put together, composed to solve a large array of problems. And it's about experimentation rather than known solutions, for the most part. So I think that's very useful in the computational science discipline. So for instance, as I'm sure Keyes will tell you, there was an industry around making up a slightly different Krelov method and publishing it when you run it on one problem without comparing to anything else for a decade, almost, of the 80s. Uh, and Petsy was developed directly in response to this because they said, we don't know what's better because we can't compare anything. Now, I think almost any of the mentioned Krelov methods can be done easily with Petsy. In fact, without recompiling or recoding, you just give different command line options and you can compare all of them. And in fact, everything that's been said today, I can run directly right now with no new code and show you the answer. And we have killed this field of making slight tweaks in publishing papers. So you have to go somewhere else. And that somewhere else, I think, right now is 
doing a slightly different tweak to the discretization or doing a slightly different tweak to the mesh because no one writes papers where they compare what's better, tetrahedral meshing or quad meshing for this particular problem, or what's better, um, this mixed uh, element or this spectral element because no one's code can run them all, which I think is very sad. So we're trying to expand the space of stuff that we can do parametrically so you can make these comparisons. Because without those comparisons, I think most of these papers are just useless that people churn out. Papers that say, I have a proof about this method can be useful in the absence of reproducibility. Papers that say, I have a scientific result that comes out of computation are useful. But papers that say, I ran this and I got this performance are absolutely useless unless you can reproduce it. So Barry says something about this stuff being hard, but this is the, the cooler quote, in my opinion. This is Bill Gropp, uh, who, if you have not met him, is, is the force behind the development of MPI, and he wrote MPitch with Rusty Lusk uh, while they were developing MPI. And so what's he saying? He's saying things about the way that we think about software. And he says, a lot of people that he deals with think about software in this way. They think, well, what I'm really after is I want to get everything vectorized. Or I would like this matrix assembly routine that is quite fast. And he says, unless you have a big picture of how the code fits together, that doesn't work very well, especially for distributed memory parallelism. There's another side which Bill didn't talk about in this interview because he doesn't see it very often, but I see it all the time, and that's the side that has a, a big picture overview that is nearly useless. So this is one that I see a lot where someone will say, well, what we have is a solver, and then we have visualization, and we probably have error estimation here. And it feeds back in. And this is supposed to be a useful drawing. And the reason it's not useful is not discussed. It's not useful because the abstraction here is box. And box is not an abstraction with much leverage. I can't take box and go over and do something else. Abstractions with leverage tend to come out of the mathematics. So one good example that we saw today is linear algebra. If I can phrase my problem linear algebraically, and we did for CG in Keyes' talk, I can right away parallelize that because I have parallel implementations of that abstraction. So there's a lot of leverage there. And I can, for instance, write my quadratic programming solver solely in terms of linear algebra. So there's a lot of leverage there. So if I have that implemented, I can run that. And I think we don't say enough about there being great value in conceptualizing the interfaces based on the mathematics. So my argument in the implementation of unstructured grid stuff in PETC is that there's a lot of leverage in thinking about unstructured grids as Haas diagrams. And, and I try to show that and that we can do an awful lot with very little code. And to allow this kind of junk that doesn't really have an abstraction that can do things, just kind of belittles the, the science of, of writing software interfaces. So Petsy is, as I said, a set of libraries. It's freely available. In fact, you can take it and sell it you know, it's totally within our license. Uh, it is usable by anyone, so even industrial users who want to incorporate it in their code and not tell anyone, that's okay. Uh, and they do. And it's got 24-7 support by a lot of us, and it has bindings for many, many languages. And it can run on essentially any platform. I was trying to think of one that we cannot run on, and the only one I could think of that we have in is Raspberry Pi. But we should be able to run on it, because it runs Linux, so I don't see why we couldn't. We just, I haven't done it myself. But I've run on my phone and on any number of operating systems and on every parallel machine that we know of. 
Um, so what kinds, I just want to give you an idea of the possible uses um, just so you might think, oh, I do something like that. Maybe I should look at how people have used it. All of the things that are pink or magenta, according to LaTeX, uh, are links. So the idea here is you say, well, maybe this is something that looks like what I might need. So there's lots of different projects that use it um, that I think are neat. So the, another question you might have is, suppose that it does apply to the, the area that I want it to apply to. Is it, is it scalable enough for me to really use? Is it just a toy? Is it just for you know, doing a few things in my lab? And that's a fair question. Uh, in, I think it scales up pretty well. So you can do large problems. You can do problems on very large machines. Um, they, there are no overheads that grow as the, the machine grows or the problem grows. So you can run very efficiently on these big things. Um, oh, and for people who don't normally run bandwidth limited things, 23% of peak is great. Uh, usually you're down around a few percent of peak. Uh, and I'll talk about that because I think that is one of the major misconceptions that people have when they are uh, writing an application or when they read marketing material. So if you've ever read a paper that says, I got 100x speed up, that's a lie. Okay, and the way that the lie is being told can vary. You can, you can be comparing apples and oranges because it's just incomparable systems, or you can be running a really bad algorithm versus an improved algorithm on different hardware, so you, you confound the two things. But if you, in a, in a disciplined way, look at what is responsible for performance and then look at what the architectures can deliver between any of the competing architectures, you're talking for the computations here at most a factor of two. And if anyone reports more than a factor of two, you know right away that they're, they don't know what they're doing. Um, so I'll show you explicitly, but that's the way it is. So when people talk about what kind of hardware should I use, you pretty much just have to run streams to get the first order idea, and I'll, I'll show that. Um, so I'll just quickly show you some of the things that I worked on that I thought were cool. So Pyleth is something that simulates crustal dynamics. It can do an earthquake rupture. It can do the quasi-static relaxation between ruptures. It can handle different rheologies, different fault constituent models like rate and state friction. It can handle 1D and 2D, 3D problems embedded in the same domain. And it runs in parallel. And the thing I did for this was I did all of the unstructured mesh management. And we still support this. This is something done by the, C the NSF CIG project. And you can see we can do all these different kinds of meshes in the same, with the same code. Um, we can also do, so a related geophysical thing would be magma dynamics. And this is cool because it is a multi-physics system. Here we're just solving elasticity. Here we're solving um, for a porous uh, flow in a deforming matrix. So you have uh, both the solid and liquid phases that you're solving for. And it's, it's a neat multi-physics problem, and I worked on you know, not only the discretization, but how you do the solver. And you, you can get neat effects like channeling here. That's porosity. And, this here is porosity, and you create these channels dynamically, so you don't know the scale when you start. And we worked on, on fracture. This is a variational formulation of fracture mechanics with Blaise Bourdon at LSU. And you can do, the neat thing with this is you can do 3D intersecting cracks. They don't have to be prescribed. They just come out. It's kind of cool. And I've done uh, also things that have to do with boundary integral methods. So this is the vortex fluid method that you use for high fidelity um, you know, uh, flow without viscosities. And I have also used that to do gravity modeling. So this is looking for mountains with Dave May at Oxford. And complex fluids. 
So lots of different things. And this is not something I did, but this is something that uh, Dave Fuentes and Tinsley Oden at UT did, where they were solving PD-constrained optimization problems for guided surgery. It's pretty cool. And this one's actually, that's a person, but this is a dog that they were doing thermal cancer therapy on. And I think it lived, so good, right? Um, so those are some of the, give you an idea about the range of applications that we're able to handle. And the way that we do it is we have a small number of pieces that are easily composable and can be put together. And so the idea is that, the, what I want to emphasize to you is that having simple conceptual framework that can be composed together can generate some really beautiful, very complex and, and tailored solvers. So uh, most of the rest of here is about installation, and I'll just kind of skip over installation unless anyone has a question. But for instance, I'll just stop here for a second. I wanted to give you an idea. Um, so when I am running normal FEM problems, um, and uh, for installation, I generally say, well, I'd like uh, mesh generators in 2D and 3D, and um, P-Forest is a, a structured adaptive mesh, so kind of like a generator. And then I'd like mesh partitioners, and Pragmatic is a parallel coarsener and refiner at the same time, which is pretty cool for unstructured meshes. And then HDF5 and Exodus 2 for output. And I also started using GMP and MPFR for arbitrary precision stuff, um, mostly high precision quadrature for boundary elements. But this can all, all comes for free. So there's like, there's a 60 of these packages that we support, or more than that now. And we're always willing to support new ones if, if people request them. And this is how we proceed. So we configure, we, we automatically set up the interface to these packages so that you can make use of them. I should have put on here mumps. I always, always, always build with that. Um, generally mumps and super LU dist because direct solvers should be your first option for anything. We haven't talked a lot about them, but any problem you run, you should run a direct solver first to get your physics right. And once you're certain that it's right, then you can start backing off and, and running some iterative methods and stuff like that, but only after that. Oh, and I put this thing in. You can also configure four you know, accelerators if you want to try those. I think it's important to experiment. Um, and you can do CUDA, you can do OpenCL, and this is the OpenCL lines that work with Apple out of the box. You can turn on single precision, which is a lot of people that run accelerators want. And you know, here's a non-exhaustive list of all the things that you can download, kind of separated into categories. Um, and then building. But I, I do want to talk a little bit about MPI. Uh, so PETC is designed to be parallel from the word go, and you're not supposed to write separate parallel code and, and serial code. You just write one code, and uh, everything should work. It may be slower than you want at the time, and you can optimize it, but it will always work. So I'll show, you, I want to, I'll show examples of that. But the way that the parallelism is accomplished is MPI, which I think is the only, in my opinion, only well-designed parallel library. And by that, I mean that they got the one thing that you want to get right, right, which is scope. So the idea is, what do you need to know when you're running in parallel? And most of what you need to know is, who am I talking to? And you want to have a nice, dynamic way of saying, who am I talking to? And that, in MPI, is a communicator. And a communicator is a scope in every sense of the word, because you can also attach data to it, which is scoped to that communicator. So you can have a piece of data that only the, the processes that are talking to each other have access to. And so every object that we create has a communicator, and that says, this is the group of processes that are participating. So for instance, it's easy to make code that uses part of a machine to solve the fluid part and part of the machine to solve the pressure part because you just create, you split the initial communicator into two parts and you make two solvers that have these two communicators and they can run concurrently and stuff like that. And that's the kind of freedom that MPI 
gives you. And in order to understand parallel performance, you really only under, have to understand two things for MPI, whether you're doing collective or point-to-point -point communication. And so in the documentation, we tell you if a routine is collective. And uh, that's you know, the best way to model what is happening with communication. You have some things that are network bandwidth limited, point to point, and some things that are latency limited, like the reductions. And it's pretty easy to work out what happens. So PETC runs totally, uh, well, not totally, but the, I think the right way to run PETC to drive it is to write a very simple code that you rarely alter and then customize things by giving command line options. And we, for instance, allow you to view any object from the command line in different ways. You can give the type. So for instance, you can view to binary data, draw, which is it draws it on the screen, or you can send it to MATLAB. And you can, if you've chosen the type, you can give a file name for the output, and then you can give a format. So you can output to a text file in ASCII format, or in verbose ASCII, or in MATLAB format, or in any of these various things. And it gives you a flexible way to not insert all this debugging code into your code. I like the code itself to remain very clean and it, to be flexible in how you, you choose to execute it. And you can do the same thing. So viewing, in our, our idea of viewing is that you, you output uh, a description of the object. Monitoring is outputting a description of the process. So you might monitor a solve. And here, the monitor would print out the residual at each step, or the true residual, meaning the one that's not preconditioned, or the solution norm, or the update norm, or the singular values of the system matrix, or the approximation to the system matrix at every step. So this is, again, a way not to over-instrument your code. And there's lots of ways to get the precise information about the stuff that I have just glossed over. So you can go to the website. There are, is a PDF manual. There are manual pages for every function. There are manual pages for every example. The examples are hyperlinked to the manual pages for each function. I should show you this. I think I can. OK. So suppose you wanted to know something about this. Oh, but that's. That's un really unfortunate, isn't it? It's like, how do I, oh, what I have to do? I think if I do that, yeah. OK, so suppose we want to look, we want to know how something works, like nonlinear solver creation. Oh, come on. Oh, that's a pain in the butt. OK, well, I'll do it later. Um, hmm? No, I was, on the, I was on the network here, and it was working, but it kind of drops out sometimes. Um, so you can go there. Plus, there's a mailing list, uh, Petsy Mate, which we answer very quickly all the time. And I encourage you to mail if you have any kind of question. There's lots of people on it, and they're in lots of different time zones. So you should get an answer on the order of minutes, hopefully. Um, so. That was just the quick introduction to what you might be able to do. Now I was going to do some nuts and bolts. Uh, and after that nuts and bolts talk, I have two kind of more advanced things that I probably won't have time to talk about all of for. So one of them is talking about how we think about discretization. And so I was going to talk about structured meshes, unstructured meshes how they interact with finite elements or finite volumes or finite differences, and how that talks to the solver and tells it things. I think, in my opinion, if you are writing a new piece of code in 2016 and you're not using a multi-level solver, you are really penalizing yourself. I wouldn't do it. I think it's a waste of your time. Uh, so really consider looking, spending more time thinking about what solver you're using and doing some sort of hierarchy, hierarchical solver 
for any new code. I can understand if you have an existing code and it just runs and you're happy with that, that's fine. But if you're developing something, don't waste your time writing something that's not scalable. I, I, don't, I don't see the point. Because honestly, even the, you might think, I don't need a scalable thing. I'm not running on a big parallel machine. Generally, the scalable methods are faster, even on a serial machine. Certainly true of multigrid for the Poisson equation will be way faster than the alternatives even in serial. Uh, and then the other thing I want to talk about is um, more advanced solvers. So I was going to show you um, using the Stokes problem as a prototypical multi-physics thing. I was going to show you here's how we could do uh, multi-physics from the command line. You don't have any extra code. You don't. Uh, you, you don't choose the kind of solver you want from the beginning. You experiment step by step and develop a high performance solver. And so I think I'll do that first because I think that's what people want to see more than the discretization stuff, but you can tell me. But I'm going to do the stuff that's less interesting for me, but foundational right now, just so you know what I'm talking about. It's really hot, I know. I'm sweating to death. Uh, so uh, I think the key here is that I don't see much value in developing some sort of toy first approach. I've done it that way, and I've been doing this a lot of years, and I think what's much more effective is to start with your real physics, but in a cut down situation, so a very small grid, uh, maybe 2D instead of 3D if you can do it, but not a toy in the sense of a, of a computer scientist who might say, let's get rid of all of the coefficients and let's have something that's very nice and a, and a nice stencil and things. I would start with the problem that you really want to solve in the simplest scenario you know how to write down and then start building from there. Um, so this is more for library writers. There's a really good article by Bill Gropp uh, about things that libraries should never do, like print to the screen, because you're going to be included in someone else eventually, and they won't want to print to the screen at that point. Printing to the screen can actually slow you down by a factor of 10 at best on these large parallel machines like Edison. And, you know, always propagate underlying error codes back instead of aborting and things like that. And I think it's just a great list and it shows you the kind of simple design principles that make a usable library versus one that someone just throws up on their web page. So if you were thinking about trying to incorporate Petsy into a code you already have, like say you have a nice code and it simulates a ship, you know, or something like that, and you would say, well, you have a solver that I might like to have. How would you do it? And this is how I would do it, because I've done this a few times. And what I would say is, first, put your code under version control before you do anything. Before you make one more keystroke, put it under version control. There's no argument for doing anything else. I don't care if you're one person that develops it. I don't care if it's one source file. Put it under version control. I know there are some people sitting in the audience that don't use version control, but hopefully we can change that before you leave. Everyone should install Git and put everything they own under version control. I have everything on this Mac under version. Even my dot files are version controlled so that when my brother drops my laptop onto the floor and the hard drive dies, I can just clone onto a new drive. Uh, after that, um, you just have a very simple initialization and you can get a lot of value because we do command line processing even for Fortran, which most people don't know how to do for the different Fortran compilers. We can do profiling uh, of your code with only those two inclusions. And after you have got the simplest link running and you profiled your code before, then we would change over the linear algebra. We would put it in our interface. And once you do that, then we can profile after and see if we wrecked anything or made it faster. And then once you're 
once your code obeys the linear algebra interface, then the solvers are free. And the, the solvers, there's nothing else to do. And that's the leverage of the, the numerical linear algebra interface. That's what makes it so powerful. And that's why, frankly, everyone can agree on it. One of the reasons that linear algebra is a done deal is that Petsy and Trellinos and Dune and Hyper and all these different codes ex agree, exactly agree on what the linear algebra interface should be. Uh, and I think it's wonderful. Um, this is not true of almost anything else. Unstructured meshes, finite elements, anything else, the interface is not agreed on at all, even conceptually. And that holds us back from comparing a lot of stuff. So let me show you what I mean by initialization. If in your code, at the beginning, you put a call to Petsy initialize, and what this will do is it sets up our static data things, and it also sets up MPI if you have not, if you have not called MPI initialize. And then the end of when, you, of when you're done with using Petsy, you call Petsy finalize. That's it. That's the simplest code. That's the simplest way to integrate Petsy, and you get profiling and debugging and a lot of stuff. So for instance, after you do that, you can use log view to get a performance profile. Uh, used to be log summary, so we changed the name. You can add in custom uh, performance logging. And this, uh, I'm gonna show you precise code for that very shortly, but I wanna make the comment that one of the things we try to do is we try to give you the same interface that we use. So for instance, most people, when they write a code, have some way of, say, of timing. So if they have an operation like matrix multiply, they time it. And they might even output a re little report that said matrix multiply took this long for you. So what we do for you is we make our reports extensible. So our report does report matrix multiply and vector dot product and all those but you can add your own operation that you want timed and it'll appear in our report. Not only that, you can add what, what we call stages, which is an aggregation domain. So say you call matrix multiply five times. Usually what people do is they just add them all up. So collectively matrix multiply took this long. But you can indicate stages in your code where you say, okay, every event that happens in here add together and every event that happens here add together, but they're separate. So you can, for instance, segregate a large velocity solve from a smaller pressure solve and tell the difference. And we give you complete control over the command line processing. So you can set aliases and you can integrate stuff into the help and you can tell if someone gave an option that wasn't used and all this kind of stuff. So you have complete control. Uh, and so, that should be doable in, you know, an hour or, or less um, with your code. And once you've got that linking, you know, then we can say, okay, let's take a look at the algebraic interface that you're using. So Petsy, you know, like everyone else, builds this interface on vectors and matrices. I guess I should point out, there have been a few people who do not agree. <laughs> So the Hilbert class library was a very cool piece of software that said we are conceptualizing things wrong and you should really start in terms of spaces, which they had as factory things and they created vectors and matrices and stuff like that. Very neat, but we don't do it that way and, it, and Hilbert class library is dead now, so I don't know. I still thought it was kind of nice. But vectors uh, represent any kind of discrete function. So solutions, right-hand sides, coefficients, anything that you th can think of as a, a function is a vector. The way that we store vectors is contiguous chunks of data on each process, but that has nothing to do with the interface. So there are implementations of the vector imp interface for Petsy that aren't contiguous chunks. So Samurai is an oversight grid package from Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California. And that uses Petsy vectors, but they have non-contiguous storage because it's burger Coella type of thing. Uh, and so vector creation looks like this. 
which is how any object creation in Petsy looks. You have a generic constructor that just takes a communicator. And that says, this object is supposed to be shared among what processes? So you can give it self, so just a serial object, or you can give it world, everyone shares this guy, or whatever domain you want. Then for vectors in particular, you would give it a local and a global size, and you can give it whichever one you want. So you can say, well, I know the global size, I don't know the local size, so use Petsy determine, or I know the local size, I don't know the global size, use Petsy determine for the global size, it will figure it out. Um, or you can give both, doesn't matter. Um, and then you may give it a type, um, but you don't have to. And what do I mean by type? Petsy is object-oriented, and it is implemented in C, so we have to write the object-oriented stuff ourselves, but it behaves very much like Objective-C. So how many people know what Objective-C is, or don't know? How many people have never seen a line of Objective-C? Okay, lots of people. So let me tell you what the difference is. So C++ looks like this. I have a class, vec. And C++ would say something like abstract class, maybe. And then I have a particular implementation, like uh, MPI vec. And that stores data a certain way and calculates the, uh, calculates the things like dot product a certain way. Um, so at compile time, all of the calls for VEC must, uh, must resolve to exactly something here. And if I want to call a function that's only an MPI VEC, like get you know, num processes, something that wouldn't be in a vector, um, then I have to do what's called a downcast. I have to know that this subtype of vector is being used. And if that thing turns out not to be one of those, it'll fail and abort your code, or you have to put a check in. It all gets very messy. So on the other hand, Objective-C would allow you to do something like this. It allow you to call this function, and if it doesn't exist, it just ignores it. And this is what happens in Petsy. So for instance, in Petsy, you can do something like this. You can create a KSP. And then you could say, oh, um, You could say, oh, I want 50, I want GMRES 50, right? Well, what if that's not GMRES? What if it turns out to be BICG or some other thing? Um, in in Petsy, you, this just gets ignored. In another language, you would have to say, oh, well, first we'll check the type of the KSP. We'll find out if it's GMRES. If it's GMRES, then we'll call these functions which puts a lot of extra garbage in your code and I think is just not necessary. So I think this is a little easier. And then the last thing that you do is call, is you can call this set from options. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's a question. Yeah. Oh, we check if they're consistent. Yeah. yeah, automatically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could, you could potentially give sizes that were not consistent, but it would give you an error and say these aren't consistent, which you could catch and change it but if you wanted, or you could just let it abort. So set from options says um, read in command line arguments and customize the thing based on those arguments. So for instance, a command line argument might be something like this. So set the type of the solver to by CG stat. Uh, or if you want me to do a vector one, mm, I think uh, CUDA. So you can say, oh, this vector is of type CUDA. So therefore, the storage lives on the GPU and execute all of the operations on it on the GPU. So this is how we get 
the leverage so you can write one code, but you can move certain objects onto accelerators and stuff like that. Um, you know, it supports all the normal vector operations, plus we have a direct interface for the values, and I'll show you that. Um, one thing, the notable thing here is that we support a very nice encapsulated notion of communication. So for parallel operations, um, lots of times you can get away with the operations of linear algebra. You can say, well, everything I'm doing is a matrix vector product or vector dot products or algebraic operations in the algebra of vectors. But what if it's not? What if you want to do something like oh, I would like to gather all the data from these eight points in the vector that constitute my observe observation stations, and then I want to write it out. And I want that to work in parallel. Well, how do you do it? And so the interface that we have, our original interface was something called a VEX scatter. And what it said is, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, Think of the vector as just something numbered 1 to n. And I'm going to list some numbers. So maybe you know 4 and 5 and 18 and 374. Uh, they're going to go to 1, 2, 3, and 4. And these are global indices. So this says globally, these numbers go to those numbers. And what would happen is this vector of you know, whatever length, 500, would be mapped into this vector of, I'm assuming, 4 right here. And so this would work no matter how many processes you ran on or what kind of architecture or something like that. And it's a way to write unstructured types of communication portably. And in fact, we use this when we do our parallel sparse matrix uh, multiply. So what we say is, well, you take uh, the columns that have non-zeros in this row or in this block, and you map those things from the vector x into some squashed vector on my process, and then do the local multiply. And so we reuse our own abstractions. Uh, PetCSF is a generalization. What you can see here is this is two-sided. Everyone needs to know what goes where. Um, whereas PetCSF, it's, SF stands for star forest, it allows you to specify just one half of the graph. It, it says, oh, uh, every process specify what information it wants from somebody. And then we will figure out, we will send that information to the somebodies so that they know to send. And, and everyone rendezvous, but we do that in a way that doesn't collectively block. He uses this nice Torsten Heffler uh, algorithm that uses I barrier and is totally scalable. So it's really nice create two-sided that, that we have with, with SF. So it's just a refinement, plus SF works for any data type and scatter just works for data types that can fit in vectors. So you can give arbitrary MPI data types to PetCSF and it will communicate them. And so we use this, so we have general communication routines that say, um, send everything in the halo on this unstructured grid to the other partner, and, you, and we have net, uh, simulations that do power grid systems, and each node in a power grid has maybe 30 or 40 items that define it, and each edge has that, and you can send these custom types over and it will do everything right for you. So you can build arbitrarily complicated data structures that it will send uh, efficiently in parallel with this easy kind of interface. Um, so let me show you um, how vector assembly works to try to get you, give you an idea about how you write portable parallel code. So um, when you say, I would like to put something in a vector, what you do is make a call somewhat like this. You say, OK, I have, n, I have n values I want to put in. Here are the rows they go in. Here are the values. And you, and you can execute as many of these calls as you want. And what happens is, locally, if we own the value, we stick it in. But if we don't, if it belongs in another process, we keep it. 
And then when you call VecAssembly begin, we start sending them. And when you call VecAssembly end, we wait till everyone's got them and then you can proceed. So in between assembly begin and end, you could do things, you can compute. So you can overlap communication and computation in a simple way. So let me show you real code. So if you add a serial code and it set a vector uh, to have values one to 100, it might look like this. And then you say, OK, I want to run this in parallel. What do I do? And you, you can do this. You can say, OK, um, I'll just wrap an if around it so only process 0 does the value setting. So that's one way to do it. And that would work. You would have one guy. He would set all the values. It would automatically communicate the values to whatever process needed to get it. And everything would be correct. So you could do this to your serial code. The thing you don't want to do, I think this is like falling off. Yeah. The thing you don't want to, the reason you don't want to do that is because you can see that it's going to send n minus 1 over n percent or fraction of the values, right? So pretty bad. Uh, so it'll work, but it won't be terribly efficient. So this is, you know, our kind of goal is to get you working quickly. We have ways that'll handle everything for you. But if you'd like to be efficient, it's only a little bit harder. So how would you do this efficiently? Well, what you might say is, ask the vector, well, only tell me which values you own. So low and high would be the, the indices that this process owns. And then I would just loop over those and set the value. This is purely local, so the assembly begin and end do not communicate anything. And so it's not that much harder to get your code to be scalable, but you have to think a little bit about dividing the index space. So we give you a way to do it where you don't have to think right away. And you know, all these, all these operations work. So the, the very next thing that everyone wants to do is they want direct access to the values, which I think is perfectly right. It's the right way to work with data like that. So we provide a way to pull out the raw pointer. And you can, <laughs> you can even do this for um, values that aren't stored locally. So if you can, for instance, pull out the CUDA pointer for GPU vectors, you know, if you want. So how does it work? So in C, you just get a pointer back. So you could do something like this. Give me the pointer, tell me the local size, meaning how many I own, and run through and, and offset everything by the rank. Right? Uh, easy. In Fortran, if you do Fortran 77, it's a little bit harder because there's not really an idea of pointers. So we can't give you a pointer back, but what we can give you is, if you give us a pointer, we can give you an offset such that that points to the right place. And then you do something very similar to C. That's a little bit cumbersome. So in F90, we can just do it the same way as C. You give us a pointer, and we give you back the right thing. And you can do it in Python, too. And it's, it's little. <laughs> so note, I think you know, we've made real headway if you look at you know, code from there to there. Uh, it's true. It's slower, but there you go. Then you can add all that code back in with Cython, making it fast. Right? Um, but it's very easy. And the way that we, we do it with Python is we always return NumPy arrays. So if you know NumPy, every, every Petsy function that returns a raw array in C returns a NumPy array. So there are no copies. Um, and since NumPy can understand strides and all that stuff, there's no transposers or reordering or anything like that. It's purely pointer passing. It's very efficient. So if, you, if your code is fast in Python, you use C types or Cython or Numba or any of the various ways to make your Python fast, it will continue to be fast with all the Petsy options because it will just pass you raw NumPy arrays around. And we also have functions like for, for structured grids, you can get back arrays that are multidimensional um, because you have an idea about how your data should be stacked. Um, so we, if we give you back an, uh, an array with 
um, you know, two uh, dimensions for 2D and three dimensions for 3D, or four dimensions if you have components in 3D and stuff like that. And you can see you can write code that looks exactly like the serial code that you would write for a finite difference method. And you can write code that it looks exactly like the serial code you would write for a finite element method. And I'm going to show a few more examples of this, but I just wanted to show this one right up front so you get an idea that it can be very easy to write scalable parallel code. And you can do it in F90. So I added this last night, because I didn't used to have it, because I never write F90, but it's doable. And it's, it's actually just as simple as C. I, I didn't write the Python version. I will. It's the same. It's, you just call that function. It pulls out a NumPy multidimensional pointer, and you can use it. So that's vectors. And hopefully, that looked pretty simple. If you had a code that's using vectors, they probably are contiguously stored, and it's almost a no-brainer to wrap, wrap vectors around. So you, uh, should have, I should have showed this. You can allocate the storage and wrap a vector around it, or we can allocate the storage, and you can pull the pointer out either way. I tend to let us allocate it because we log the storage. We put sentinels at either end to see if you ran over the memory, that kind of stuff. But it's a little bit more difficult sometimes to convert the matrix things because uh, we enforce a division between the storage format and the interface. And a lot of times in people's code, they're directly writing into the data structure. So I'll show you what I mean. So matrices are you know, discrete linear operators, and they can store a lot of stuff. And we have lots and lots of different data structures, AIJ and block structures, symmetric structures, um, jagged diagonal that works on the Earth simulator really well. We have, in, we have uh, support packages that have their own internal data structures, like MOMPS and SuperLU and OMFPAC. And so you really should never be accessing the matrix data structure directly. It just never benefits you. I've never seen performance data that suggested that writing in it directly makes any meaningful difference. Because if you're going to the trouble of making a matrix, you're either doing a solve, which will swamp anything, or if you're just doing multiplies, you still have all the work of filling the matrix. Uh, so it's created very much like the vector. You do mac create, you, set, you tell it what size is, you say the type, and you set from options. The one thing that is uh, different is that in order to be performant here, we want you to pre-allocate the matrix, which just means tell me how many items are in each row. And the way I tend to do it is I run the whole assembly process, except I don't compute the value. I just compute the, uh, the IJ that it goes in, and then I add those up and say, this is how big my matrix is. That process tends to be very, very small compared to everything else in the code. Um, I could imagine, a t a th I guess I could imagine a case where you did almost no computing, and it was, it was some sizable fraction, but I've never seen it. If you have that case, I would be interested to see why. Uh, and then when we put values in, we just call this matSetValues function, which says I have this many values. It's a logically dense block. So a logically dense block would be something like this. Usually, like, imagine you're doing finite elements, and you say, OK, I have a P1 element, and so uh, these degrees of freedom are at my vertices, and this may be 5 and 17 and 38. So I would get a matrix of values that looked a little bit like this, and maybe it's like 1 and 1 and 2 and 0 0.5, 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5, and minus 0 0.5, and 0 0.0, and 0 0.0, something like that, something that looks a little bit like the finite element Laplacian. And so <coughs> up here, what you would get is um, these would be passed in as rows, 
And these, this array would be passed in as calls, and this would be vals. And that's how it's conceptualized. Uh, so the insert mode argument is, do you want to add them or do you want to insert them? That's it. We don't have another mode. So as I said, the advantage here is that you can adaptively switch data structures. Because the data structure rarely has to do with what's going on in your code, and it almost always has to do with what architecture you're running on, which is going to change. And so you want to adaptively set the data structure for where you run. Um, so the same kind of assembly process happens. If you say mat set values um, with rows that you don't own, then we will stash those values away. And when you call uh, mat assembly begin, uh, we will start sending them, and then mat assembly end, we'll wait till everyone has them and then continue. And so you can do computations in the middle of that. Normally for vectors, I think you almost never overlap, you almost never get anything out of overlapping, but for matrices, you can really get some, something out of overlapping communication and computation. And in fact, if you have so many values there that you, you sort of are, your memory is getting too big, you can call mat assembly with flush, and what it'll do is send all the values that it has now, but wait to finalize the matrix, and you can add some more and flush and keep doing that until you're done, and then you have a final assembly. So let me show you explicitly. So imagine again you had serial code and you were doing the one-dimensional Laplacian. So the one-dimensional Laplacian, you know, if you're the leftmost guy, you put in, uh, you know, uh, minus one, two, and if you're the rightmost guy, you put in two minus, or that's backwards, two minus one, and minus one, two, and then if you're in the middle, you put this, right? And so that's what it does. Uh, and then we just said, okay, run and run in parallel, so it'll let proc zero do everything, and uh, everyone else just waits. This will work. But again, it will send almost all of the matrix to the other processors, because they're not doing anything. So how do you fix that? Well, you can fix it, uh, and I'll, I'll just show quickly, this is how matrices are stored for us. Uh, each process owns a set of contiguous rows in a matrix, and we store the diagonal block and the off-diagonal block separately. Um, that's so we can overlap the local computation with the communication that gets the off-diagonal elements from X. And so what we do is we just ask the matrix, well, what rows do we own? And then we only loop over those rows. But notice, everything is done here in the language of um, global uh, row indices. So our code didn't change. Look here, it's if row equals zero or row equals n minus one. Here, it's the same code. If row equals zero, if row equals n minus one. There'll be processors where it's never zero and never n minus one, but we don't care. Uh, and so if you operate, this is a nice, clean paradigm for turning serial code into parallel code, and that's why uh, Barry preferred it when he originally made up the interface. I can totally understand the point of view that you want to get away from global numberings. So a lot of people, especially people that do adaptive stuff, really hate global numberings and say, I don't like that, I don't want to write my code that way. I'm sympathetic to that. So instead of mat set values, you can, uh, you can call mat set values local. And that takes the same arguments, but the rows and columns are the local numbering of the rows and columns instead of the global numbering. And then you don't have the problem with global numberings. And so I, I was explaining this before, but the reason we do this is because there's no way when you're coding that you can know what data structure is going to be right. 
Um, the other point here is that we have facilities for automatically partitioning and automatically reordering your matrix. But by and large, I think that's a total mistake. You should really never use them. <laughs> Get the ordering and the partitioning right on the basis of your discretization. So if you're using a mesh, get that right. Or if you're using some kind of point cloud, distribute that right first. Then your linear algebra is going to come out right. Don't get a screwed up linear algebra and then try to fix it at that stage, because it's totally wrong way. It's, it's backwards. So what I told you is, if we convert all of the uh, linear algebra, then the solvers should just come for free. And they basically do. Oh, I wanted to point this out. So I put the slide in after I heard Keyes' talk. So um, it's really, really hard to say anything about how a solver will perform a priori on the basis of theory. So here's two interesting papers. I think these are great. So one is you know, Nick Trefethen and, and Noel Noctegal and Satish Reddy saying, oh, we're going to take a bunch of different solvers and a bunch of problems, and we're going to see which solver is the best. And it turns out that different solvers are always the best. There's no one that beats it even a, a, li a sizable fraction of the time. And so their, their idea is, wow, there's no good practical criterion that we can use to determine what to use. And then this paper is one of the most shocking papers I have ever read, because I tried for years years to understand what kind of spectral criteria could we use to, to, to predict the performance of a Krilov solver, right? But this paper says, basically, you can't if all you're going to assume is the spectrum. So it's a beautiful paper. This is like four pages long. In four pages, here's what they do. They say, give me the spectrum that you want. So any spectrum, you write it down. Give me the spectrum. Then I will choose a convergence curve, any non-increasing convergence curve. I could draw this, or I could draw this guy, or this guy, anything, anything that is not increasing. And I can make a matrix with that spectrum that will have that convergence curve for GMRS. That is an amazing null result. That says that alone, the spectrum tells you absolutely nothing. The spectrum with symmetry tells you everything, just about, as, as we were shown. The spectrum with normality, and this is what he showed, tells you a lot, um, because you can get these, these oval bounds. But if you don't have that, if you have a non-normal matrix and a spectrum, you don't know anything. And it's, it's a really beautiful construction. It's just a polar decomposition of the matrix where you encode your convergence curve in R in your spectrum, and it's just beautiful. And so the, what it means, however, is that you just have to try these things out. And so we're trying to give you a platform where you can just try it out. Um, so how do linear solvers work? Well. Um, you create them. Oh, I can't believe I left it off. You just do KSP create with a communicator. Uh, and then you say, these are the operators I have. Oh, that's, that's wrong. OK, so that last argument doesn't exist anymore. This is what happens when you use old slides sometimes. So the, the, don't worry about the flag. It doesn't exist. You just give two operators, A and M. What are they? So A is what you think it is, if you think that it is the system matrix. What is M? M is almost the preconditioner. M is the matrix that you want to use to calculate the preconditioner. Usually, that's A. But it doesn't have to be. So let me give you an example. Suppose I'm doing the spectral element method. OK, what happens? Spectral element people solve this all the time. A, X equals B. Um, but how do they discretize? Well, on each cell, you know, you have some kind of GLL quadrature rule. And uh, so you get this tensor product discretization. And you never explicitly form the matrix. What you say is, oh, I can apply it very fast. And if I formed it, it would take so much memory, I'd just bankrupt my memory reserves. So what do I do? So 
what we do here for spectral elements is we say A is a matrix, but it doesn't have entries. It will be what we call, so matrix is an interface, and there's an implementation mat shell. And mat shell executes everything except the set values interface. It, it will error. It says, no, I don't do this. But you, it can do mat mul you know, mat matrix vector multiplication. So you would say, pass in a shell matrix for A, but a shell matrix, since I can't get the values out, how do I compute a preconditioner? So you pass another matrix in for M, and that matrix is, could be something like, suppose that I divide up my cell like this, and then I just do P1 in all these little guys, right? Uh, it's a very sparse matrix compared to the original spectral matrix, but it's a good approximation. And then you pass that in, and then maybe we'll do multi-grid on that matrix. So we set up the interface to take a, an operator that defines the system and an operator that you use to calculate a preconditioner. And you can access sub-objects like what is the preconditioner, and then you can set the types dynamically, like KSP type by CG stab and PC type multigrid, there's MG. Uh, it's the same for nonlinear solvers, almost, except that with linear solvers, you can get all of the information you need from these static objects, matrix. But uh, in the nonlinear world, you generally need to keep reevaluating as you change the, uh, the, the approximate guess. And so instead of just objects, we need functions. We need callback functions. Give me the function that evaluates the residual. Give me the function that evaluates its Jacobian. Now, you only really need to give me the residual, and I can approximate the Jacobian, but I'll show that later. And these solvers can be controlled, again, from the command line. You can set the type of solver, the type of preconditioner. So there's a nonlinear preconditioner. We, uh, you can set the convergence tolerances. You can say view, which will show you a report about exactly what solver you have. You can say monitor, which will show you the progress of the iteration that you have now. Uh, and we develop solvers, but we recognize that Petsy is a tiny, tiny portion of the solver infrastructure. And lots of people develop awesome solvers. And so we try to wrap up all of them. Uh, and they're great, and we, we can't touch these guys in their domain. But the idea here is to make them all available so you can test them against each other and figure out which one is the best one for your problem. And if you know one that we don't have, tell us, and we will put it in. And, oh yeah, here's more. And this link here is a complete table online of everything that we support. And that table has things like, does it work in parallel? Does it work for symmet only symmetric systems? You know, and, and all the other kinds of things you have to know in order to use it. So this is my artist's conception of what your code should look like. Uh, I want codes that don't have any customization of the solver in the code. This means you never recompile. So what this does is it creates a solver. Here it's nonlinear. It could be linear. It tells the solver about the discretization. So it says set DM, and this DM object tells the solver what it needs to know from the discretization. So what's one thing you might tell it? One thing you might tell it is this discretization has three fields. Here they are. You know, here's the division. That allows me to do things like sure complement solvers, which I'm going to show you after we take a break. When do we break, by the way? Four? Four? OK, good. And um, it does set from options. And then the, the DM could do things like, give me the correct size global vector for this problem. Give me the correct size global matrix for this problem. And so you get one out, and you call solve. That should be it. Everything else can be constructed dynamically from the command line. And 
This is not a parlor trick. This is truly, in my opinion, the way you should handle these things. Why? Because optimal solvers depend on the equations that you're solving, but also the regime that you're in, and the machine that you're on, and the boundary condition data you chose that time, and the input, and the particular implementation that you have, and whether or not you're part of a larger solve, and you need certain kinds of uh, accuracy criteria. So, if I'm solving in the middle of, a, of an optimization loop, I don't have to be as accurate as I would if I'm solving the full problem to physical accuracy, and therefore, I might use a different kind of solver. So, in my view, this kind of organization is the way to code up the solve part. What, whatever you want to do on the discretization part of the viz part or the physics, anything, that's up to you. But Doing more than this on the solve, I think, is a huge mistake. It makes your code fragile, and it makes it uh, uh, less portable, and it just makes it more harder to understand in general. If a, new, if a new person enters your lab and sees this, it's really clear what's happening. So I was just going to, you might say, can you solve anything real with that? Isn't that, you know, is that just kind of a fake? So I was just going to show directly from an example. So the way that Petsy examples are labeled, they have the unit that they come from. So nonlinear equations, Krelov subspace things, time stepping, and then a number. OK, I, I, I totally agree that you can criticize this. Um, might say, shouldn't they have a name, what they're, what they're solving, or something like that. And every time we try to do that, it, it messes up. Like, we change the internals of, of the thing a little bit, and then the name doesn't match. Or we, we allow it to solve two different problems, and then what should the name be? And so it's, it's a complicated thing. So we have just decided to stick with numbers. But this example 62 solves a nonlinear Stokes problem. And as you can see, I set the code up just about exactly how I said you ought to set the code up. There's a lot of other code in that example. It's like 400 lines long. But this part, the solver part, is pretty pristine. So you don't have to recompile. And I can do some very complicated solvers, which is the first thing I will show after the break. Um, so I'm just going to go through a little. So what you can see is I create the solver. I tell it about the discretization, I set from options, and then I create the vector. So you can do stuff like, suppose you say, look, I know. I know that by default, I want to have periodic restarts. And if my user wants to override it, fine. But I'd like this to be the default. Well, you can do that. And you can do it in such a way that even if your user decides he's going to change this type, and it's meaningless, it's not going to cause your code to fail. It's just going to be in there. So no downcasting, no checks. And you can separate uh, different solvers by giving them what we call prefixes. This is just like giving it a name. So you can name this solver Stokes, and then you can name another solver Percolation, and you can name another solver Darcy, or something like that. And then when you address it on the command line, uh, you, can, you can distinguish. So for instance, Suppose I had a Stokes solver and a Darcy solver, right? Then I could say minus Stokes, SNES, type, Newton, because it's harder. And I could say minus Darcy, SNES, type, quasi-Newton, because it's easier. And you can do this for every type of object. You can give matrices different names. So you can give one matrix type to one, another matrix type to the other. You can give vectors different names. You can give anything a name that you want and therefore control it individually. For instance, uh, I can view just one of these, minus Stokes underscore SNES underscore view. So just one of them prints out. And then the last thing I need to do is to give a function that forms the residual. So at the most basic level, you just give me a function. You do whatever you want to do. I just let you go. Um, but if you do that, you have to handle things like parallel communication and the geometry and the discretization. 
And so you can buy into what we think about these things progressively. So you might say, well, I still want to handle all my geometry and discretization, but I really like if you did the communication for me. So how do you do it? And so what you can do is you can say, oh, well, I'll, I'll define a local function, and then the, the only thing I need to tell you is the local to global map. So you can say, here's a local to global map, and normally people who, who partition their own things know this. And then you can define a local function. That just runs over your piece, and then Petsy automatically does the communication at the end. Um, now, you can say, oh, I, I don't want to even define my local global map. I want you to do the partitioning and the management. And so we, for structured and unstructured grids, we can do that if you can encode your grid. For structured grids, it's usually pretty easy. It's like this many, this many, and this many, and then uh, we'll split it up for you and we'll do all the communication and create the maps. If it's an unstructured grid, it's actually not that much harder. We just have to agree on a way you to, for you to tell me about it. And the, I have interfaces that read in triangle output and exodus output and MED output and, and lots of different kinds of files. And you can tell me in a raw way, you can just say, look, I have cells, they have these vertices. And, and I can create an unstructured mesh and partition it from that and do everything you want and rebalance all, all automatically. Um, optionally, you can also provide a Jacobian, but you don't have to because we can do finite differences automatically for you. And I'll show you the options uh, in the solver part. Um, and if you tell us about your, um, about your mesh and your data layout, then we can automatically do things like determine the Jacobian layout and pre-allocation and stuff. And it's not that hard to do um, we have a system where you would say, okay, suppose I have a mesh like this, suppose I have this doublet mesh, and you say, well, I have three unknowns per vertex, two unknowns per edge, and one per face, or something like that. Then we can not only calculate how big vectors are, but we can calculate how big is the matrix, and how many items per row, and how are they divided in parallel, and stuff like that automatically for you. So it's, it's pretty easy to do, and I'll, I'll go over it again if I get time. Uh, so I just wanted, at the end of the section, I just want to talk a little bit about debugging and profiling. So Petsy is pretty good at debugging support. So if something, if we get a signal, we'll generate a full trace back for you. Or if we get an error, uh, Petsy error, we'll generate a full trace back. So you can, you can see exactly where it happened. We, uh, if the default malloc in Petsy puts, uh, like if you malloc an array of memory, We'll put markers here and here so that if you write over either end, we'll see it when we free the memory and tell you about it. And you can put in error handlers. Um, I would, and we do things like we can automatically launch the debugger for you. Now, that sounds like not that much of an advantage. And it's not till you're in parallel. In parallel, that beautiful thing that we do with GDB is we can launch GDB and automatically attach it to each process or to just the processes that you specify. Like, launch GDB and attach to processes five and seven. And we'll spawn two windows and you can do it. And it's a pain in the butt to do other ways, I think. And uh, we can map the display too in case you're doing it on a cluster and you're logged in from another machine. We could route the windows back to the machine you're logging in from. And so it makes it a lot easier to interact with the debugger. Uh, however, I would say the most important thing here is always run Valgrind on your code first. Always, always, always. This is the best debugging tool ever developed. Definitely deserve the Free Software Foundation Award. Um, Seward's great for developing this tool. It's the best thing there is. And it works with MPI. So you can run Valgrind on an MPI job just fine if you give trace children equal yes, because it just forks out a bunch of children. And it, it revolutionized how we do debugging. I can't tell you the, the number of bugs we would have if we didn't have this tool.
It's amazing. And if you don't run it on your code, you're, you're penalizing yourself immensely. Uh, it also has some other tools in the package, like uh, a cache profiling tool, um, a race detection tool, and what I think is the best memory use uh, profiling tool called Massive. If you haven't used that, it's really great. Uh, I, would do an, I would do a demo if I had more time of that, but I don't. Oh, and I put in these little examples, but I just, I don't think we have time to do them. But they're in there, and if you want to ask me about them, I'll do them with you, you know, sometime when I'm not talking. So, uh, profiling, I think, is underrated. Um, you should not be profiling at the end when you say, okay, my code works, now let's start profiling. I would start profiling very early. Uh, I wouldn't get annoyed by it, but um, when you do things, okay, I'll back up. Performance data is meaningless if you don't have a performance model, okay? It just doesn't mean anything at all. Uh, because <clears throat> you can tell me, you would say, suppose you came up to me and said, I get 80% of peak. Wonderful, but are you doing tons of extra flops that you don't need to do? How would you know? Well, you would only know if you had a model for your computation, right? And you can come up to me and say, I am getting the bandwidth peak. I'm getting 95% of bandwidth. Great. But are you redundantly loading stuff that you don't need? There is a way to game every single performance metric that you want. If you tell me one, we can game it. The point is, the way to know you're not gaming it is to, at the beginning, write down a model of what's achievable for your computation. Then you measure, and then you compare to what you think it ought to be. And then you know, am I gaming it or not, right? So profiling should start early because you should already have a model of what the computation should do, and you should confirm it to first order. That, this is not tweaking around with 5 or 10% gains. This is to a factor of 2 or something like that, do I get what I expect along the way? And that just gets refined as you're doing stuff. But I, I try to do this all the time when I'm going through the code. Uh, and we try to make it easy. So as I said, you can register your own stages, meaning the, the own sections that you want added together. Uh, and you can, you can register your own events. And then you just put an event, and you can log the number of flops. And very soon, almost done, you're going to be able to to be able to specify the number of memory references because we want to calculate bandwidth because measuring bandwidth is very fraught and doesn't work very well on any architecture. Um, so here's kind of what it looks like. In C, I can register a stage like velocity solve. And then I push it, and then I do my code like KSP solve, and then I pop it. Everything that's not within a stage you declare goes in the main stage. And in Python, you just use another width, so it's easier. And it's similarly easy to define an event. And the one extra thing we have in events are we associate events with a class ID, like matrix or Krelov solver. Because we allow you to turn off all the events for a given type if you want, just because they're taking too much time. Or you don't want to look at them and similarly easy in Python. Uh, we also allow you to define class IDs. So why would you do this? So we monitor um, timing. And so what that is is for each event, we say how many times was it called, uh, how long did it take, what are the min and max across processors, how many flops did it do, how many reductions, how much data did it send, how many messages did it send? What flop rate does it achieve, right? Uh, but we also keep track of how many times did you create or destroy an object of a certain class? How much memory was associated with that object? And stuff like that. And so we track our classes. We have an ID for vectors and matrices and Krelov solvers and time steppers. You can make your own. So if you have an object and I did this, 
when I was a student, before there were unstructured grids in Petsy, there were unstructured grids in my code. And so I made a class ID, unstructured grid, and I logged the memory that was associated with it, and it came up in the report at the end, just like anything else. So if we don't have the stuff that you want, you can put it in. And so this is just talking about pre-allocation. So the important point is, if you're using matrices, you should pre-allocate, or it will be slow. Why? Because we will be calling malloc for every row, at least. And malloc is slow. And so if you don't want us to do that, you should tell us how big the rows are, and it usually does not take very long. Um, and this just shows pictures of that. Uh, so there are ways to monitor this. So the easiest way is if you give, it's, I, it's not log info anymore. Shoot, it's minus info. If you, oh, I, I put it right at the top, but I didn't change the picture. So if you get minus info, it will say, look, the matrix is this size, and I allocated this much storage space, and this much was not needed. So you kind of want to shoot for no unnecessary space and no malics, right? If you have malics, that's slow. If, if you have unneeded space, that's not so bad, because when you call mat assembly, it's going to squish out the unneeded space and give it back. Oop. So I, I don't have any more time. All right. So I want to talk about solvers when we come back, but just a little bit when we come back in the beginning, I want to talk about serial performance, because it's so important to understand you know, where this comes from so that you don't get led astray by people and with glossy uh, one-page sales pitches. Okay, great, thanks. So I, I just want to talk a little bit about serial performance because I think these ideas help you make decisions about using hardware. So as I said, in order to know what we're doing, we really need a model of the computation, but that model can be simple, okay? Uh, but you know, here's all the, the kinds of things that it could, it could incorporate. I'm going to propose a really simple model. Uh, the model says that the only things that matter in performance right now are how many flops I do and how many bytes I request from memory. Okay? That, that's not the whole world. So uh, I'm ignoring completely latency in this model, uh, which is not going to be a good model if I'm on a bigger parallel machine. But say on this laptop, it's pretty good. And on just a cluster, it's generally pretty good. Um, so what does that mean? Well, what I can say is um, I'm going to look at the ratio of the number of flops I execute in a given algorithm to the number of bytes transferred. Okay? And so what you can say is for, the alg for a given algorithm, uh, if I want to run at peak, uh, what kind of a bandwidth do I need? So this is a good question about machine balance. Alternatively, I could ask, if I'm capped at a certain peak bandwidth, what's the maximum flop rate I can ever achieve? So it's the other side of the coin for that. But they're both based on this ratio, B, which people have called the arithmetic intensity. Other people have published and called it the balance factor. There's not really an agreement. Um, so. That's just Jed being very pedantic, so I will ignore that for now. So um, let's look at a really simple operation. So this is like a prototypical vector operation, right? So what's happening? Uh, in blah speak, this is called an AXPY, but it's just scale a vector and add, another, add it into another vector. This is a very common operation. These are the kinds of vector updates that Keyes was talking about. So it does. 2n flops for a length n vector. So how's that? Well, it does n flops here, and it does n flops here. How many memory accesses does it need? Um, I am, for the moment, going to suspend disbelief and say that all memory accesses are created equal. So stores and loads are equivalent and stuff like that. It's not really true, because you can have many outstanding loads, but only one outstanding store, usually, and stuff like that. But suppose that's true. Um, then I have 3n plus 1 because I need to read two vectors and then write one vector 
and I need to load this alpha, okay? So what's the balance factor? Well, it's 2n flops over 3n plus 1, and then um, there are b bytes in whatever I'm getting. So if I'm getting a double four bytes, right? So uh, this balance factor it, it looks like 2 over 3b. So for doubles, it's like 1 sixth. OK, so what's that mean? That means I'm doing 1 sixth of a flop for every byte that I bring down, OK? So that might just sound like a number to you, but if you've looked at these numbers before, that sounds horrible. OK, why? Uh, because think of my poor uh, laptop. So this processor is like a Core 2 Duo that has a peak um, flop rate of something like 1.7 gigaflops, which is embarrassing for a machine, but it is an error. And so what this implies is that if I want to run this algorithm at peak, I need something in the 10 gigabyte range, per, or is that, or 100, I can't count. Is that uh, 10 gigabytes per second? Yep. Um, and so that's a lot greater than my peak bandwidth right here, which is uh, like 1.1 gigabytes per second. So that means that if I run this operation, um, the best I can possibly hope for, for that very simple vectorizable operation is 5.5% peak, okay? And this is great because what you're typically getting in a lot of numerical codes is something hovering about 1% to 2% of peak. And there's, there's this fiction that the flop rate determines performance. Uh, can someone name an operation where flops determine performance? This will be the question and answer portion of the... Can anyone? What's one operation that we do where flops actually count? DGEM. So matrix, ma dense matrix matrix multiplication is one. But how about dense matrix vector multiplication? No, that's bandwidth limited. Uh, and if dense matrix vector multiplication is bandwidth limited, sparse matrix vector multiplication is bandwidth limited. And all the vector operations are bandwidth limited. And there's pretty much no operation that we do in PDE solves, except maybe for, if you can manufacture dense local solves. Like in spectral elements, people get a DGEM because they say, oh, well, I have a local matrix and I'll stack up a bunch of cell right-hand sides because I have the same matrix. So if you have an inhomogeneous coefficient, can't really do that. Um, so there, it's very hard to get DGEMs out of a computation without faking it. And almost everything we do with bandwidth limited, and so they get these very poor percentages of peak. Uh, so we have a benchmark, it's called the stream benchmark, which pretty much runs what I just showed you, and it measures the memory bandwidth um, of a chip. So you can, you can run this with Petsy by doing make stream, and it will run this and make a nice plot for you using matplotlib if you have it, and it'll spit the data out. So what you can see is that on my laptop, uh, I run at about 5.5% of peak because it's a cruddy chip, because it's slow. Um, a better laptop, the Core 2 Quad, runs that operation at about 1% of peak, and you can tell how long ago I made this slide, but the Tesla 1060 runs below 1% of peak on that, and the uh, Fermi is just not even on the map in terms of percentages of peak. It's like under half a percent, I think, or something. And so it just keeps getting worse. And what this shows you is that we are making fundamentally imbalanced machines. And so when you go to the store and they say, would you like a 12 core or a 16 core? What do you say? Well, if you run PDE simulations, I would say, 
give me the four core because four cores is enough to saturate the memory bandwidth of any of those chips. And so all the other cores are not making me all that much faster. Now, if it's about the same price, if it's like 80 bucks for one and 100 bucks for another, okay, give me the other eight cores. But if it's like twice the price, then it's useless, right? Uh, and it's, so this is just trying to show you that, that the real determiner of performance is bandwidth. And so, for instance, uh, you know, the NVIDIA marketing material will say something like, the Titan you know, can do several teraflops or something like that. Great, it can. And if you're doing dense matrix matrix multiply like you're a computational chemist, that's meaningful. But if you're doing anything that's bandwidth limited, like everyone else, then what's the bandwidth of the Titan compared to the bandwidth of the equivalent Haswell? Like a dual socket Haswell board, which is about the same power as one Titan board, has a memory bandwidth that's only about a factor of two different than that, and the price differential is huge, right? So I would look very carefully at these numbers before I decided to use a particular thing. Uh, so even in the case of sparse matrices, we can essentially completely analyze the thing. Uh, most of these analysis say, suppose we're a perfect world. No cache misses, no weights on memory references, no instruction cache weights, you know, everything runs perfectly. In a perfect world, we can, this is the bandwidth needed for peak, or this is the achievable performance. And this achievable performance is, on my laptop, like 8% of peak, and it's under 5 for any of the modern chips. And you can see the whole analysis done in this very nice paper by Bill and Dinesh and David Keyes and Barry. Um, and it's, I mean, I can't emphasize enough how, how crucial it is to have a model, because I sat through, so this, this paper is like, I can't remember, it's like 99, I think. So I sat through about 10 years of papers where people were like, I'm optimizing sparse matrix multiply. And they had all kinds of numbers, like they were doing really well, right? But not really comparing to other people. And what it turns out is that it's really hard to screw up, that you essentially just have to get the bandwidth bound and then it doesn't matter anymore. And that's where we're at currently. And so when people write, they still write a fair number of sparse matrix multiply papers, but they're the, now the ground truth is I have to get the bandwidth bound and I'm just gonna do it for a different architecture or I'm gonna do it with a different format or something like that. But they've stopped this business of trying to say that they're going to really improve the performance because we have a good idea of what is achievable. Yeah, it's 8.8% .8 of peak on my laptop. You can improve it by blocking or using multiple vectors if your solver has a reason to do that. So that's, that's an option. You can also improve it by doing unassembled things instead of assembled linear algebra, like FMM or spectral elements, or nonlinear things like full approximation scheme or polynomial solvers or something like that. But this should give you the impetus to look at these new schemes. Um, uh, I don't think I need to talk about that. So I thought this would be an interest, I gave this to my class as an interesting exercise. What's the balance factor for Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization? You know, what percentage of peak can you get? And can you improve the algorithm by reorganizing? Like, does modified Gram-Schmidt run faster or slower than classical Gram-Schmidt? Why? You know, stuff like that. I think it's cool. Um, so I was going to talk about the, uh, the discretizations, but I don't think I have time to do a great job. So let's talk about solvers, because I think this stuff is really fun. This is some of the most fun stuff I get to do. So. Um, there are a ton of specially coded up solvers of this type. So um, one thing I used to do is, I, I think I still have it on these slides, I just cite the paper where the original preconditioner was published, because I'm going to show you a sequence of preconditioners that were published in a series of about 25 papers, and um, all of them were done on specially coded up implementations, lots of them in MATLAB, which then were thrown away and never used by anyone. 
So I, I consider that like a huge failure. Um, and in fact, even the implementations of this stuff that you could get, like there, there's a, a paper by a lot of guys, but it's Shuttleworth and Elman and Vicki Howell and collaborators, is that they have one, but they separately coded up each, each of these things, and you have to specially go into your code and say, I'm using this one, which I think is horrible and fragile and stuff. So I want to show you, eventually we said, well, maybe we can make all these work together through the same mechanism. And so the mechanism really says, I want to do two things. I want to have analysis. So I want to be able to break up my problem into different pieces. And then I want to have synthesis in the sense that I want to be able to put those pieces back together how I want to. And we only have about three ways, Additive, additively, multiplicatively, and using a sure complement if you have two fields. So how does it work? Well, for analysis, I say, OK, I have a preconditioner. And you say PC type field split. And then you could say something like PC field split, you know, uh, Z field zero has these components in it, field one has these components. So you can make definitions of blocks based on uh, what the DM tells you are the field numbers. Or you can say things like, just detect the saddle point. Say you know you have a saddle point problem. It's not broken up explicitly in your code. Don't worry. We will look for the saddle point. We will pull it out so you can have two fields. Um, and then synthesis, you can say, well, put it together additively, multiplicatively, or using a sure complement. And then you could, there's some control over whether you get the blocks from the preconditioning matrix or from the actual matrix, but that's a complication that I, I don't need to talk about unless people want to know. And then there's control over, for the sure complement specifically, how do I define a preconditioner for the sure complement matrix? And uh, how do I define the sure complement factorization itself, which I can show you. So let's do an example, because it's all very abstract. So I want to show you an example. So the Stokes equation is one of my favorite examples. So phrase this way, this is the, mo uh, the momentum block for uh, the velocity. So something like um, you know, rate of strain tensor. And this is the gradient of pressure, and this is the divergence block for velocity. So this is a classical formulation, right? Um, so here's an example in Petsy which does this, and I'm just going to run it for P2, P1. But you, it can do other, it can do, you know, Q2, Q1, or Q2, P1 discontinuous, or all those with different options. So what happens? So suppose you wanted to do the simplest possible preconditioner. Precondition this block with A, I have no idea what to do for the sure complement. Well, how do you do it? Well, we say, OK, we'll have an outer Krelov accelerator, GM res, uh, and then we'll say, use a field split preconditioner, combine them additively. And that just means additive combination is just another word for block Jacobi. OK? And multiplicative is another word for gauss seidel We need two words so we can keep publishing papers. And uh, so for the velocity, I'm just going to use LU. And for the pressure, I'm just going to use Jacobi, which, since it's a zero block, it just gives you the identity. This was actually published in 88. That's a real thing. It got someone a paper. So you can do this inexactly, uh, where instead of LU, you solve it with algebraic multigrid, let's say. Uh, if you do that, um, you need to use FGM res because the preconditioning operation is a nonlinear operator, not a linear operator. So I think FGM res is actually a really salient addition to the family of GM res preconditioners because it allows you to have uh, nonlinear preconditioning, basically. Uh, that was also in the same paper. Um, now, Elman in 94 says, oh, well, what if we combine them multiplicatively? <laughs> That's another paper. And so we can get that by changing this field split combination type, the, the synthesis type. And then we can get this one, which wasn't actually in his paper, but you know, could have been, uh, by just redefining what the fields mean. We can get that guy. Um, then uh, Olshansky and company uh, proved that uh, this one works, where you do a sure complement kind of preconditioner 
but you don't do the full factorization. You just have a preconditioner for A and a preconditioner for the sure complement. And you use, since you know this is symmetric, if you have a constant coefficient, you can use min res. And so that's the form that's here. But if you don't know that, um, then you can do what May and Marese did, which is just use this lower factorization and, or you can do upper. Uh, you can do uh, an exact preconditioner for A and a Richardson preconditioner for S and combine them multiplicatively, and that is Uzawa. And that was actually published first. And you only get one step Richardson is really what was in the 58 paper, but you can make that K if you want to be more accurate. They did not really understand that you could do it a couple times. Uh, you can use the full shear complement factorization, which is, I guess, even earlier, 1905, he knew how to do this. And so you can just change the factorization type from diagonal or lower and upper to full, and then solve that uh, pressure equation accurately. This, of course, is going to take a long time because Jacobi is a crap preconditioner for that thing. It's not totally bad, but it's, it's not uh, independent of H. And you can say, well, what about um, something that engineers like? So Patanker and Spalding have simple, which is very, very popular in the engineering literature. How do you get it? What they say is, OK, we almost have, see, here's the full factorization, right? We almost have that, but instead of the exact A inverse here and in the sure complement, we're going to replace it by its, the inverse of its diagonal. And you can get that by saying, oh, the inner KSP, we're just going to do Jacobi, and the upper KSP, we're just going to do Jacobi. You can do it. Um, you can do, there's a, Lowen and Wathen have something they call least squares commutator. Uh, and what that is, is some uh, different approximation for this preconditioner for S down here, and you can do that. Um, and you can, so, so we can get, you know, all of these different papers easily. So you can do this in a morning, and you can test everything anyone has ever published and see what actually works and what does not work for your problem. Because every one of these papers that I just cited, uh, except this one, does not consider a variable coefficient for Stokes. And if you're in geophysics, everything is variable coefficient Stokes. So which one of these works is an open question, and lots of them don't. And then you, uh, then you can ask yourself, well, what if I want to do more fields? Does it just work for two? No, we can do it recursively. So imagine that we have a Stokes problem coupled to heat flow, right? Um, so what we can do is we can say, well, we have FGM res on the outside. We have a field split. We combine it additively put fields, velocity and pressure, 0 and 1, in the top, and then in the second block, put just the temperature. And then for the temperature block, just solve it with LU, and it's the Laplacian. And there's no coupling because it's additive here. Uh, and, then in the, and then for the uh, fluid block, we're going to do FGM res again. We're going to do sure complement, full factorization. Uh, we're going to do LU for A, and we're going to do uh, accurate solve for S. But then we could say, well, maybe the coupling between the temperature and the, the fluid is more is stronger. So let's, instead of additive coupling, we'll do sure complement, or no, we'll do upper. Uh, and we'll do a sure complement here with regards to the, pre, uh, to the temperature. And then we'll solve that with least squares commutator and GM res. And uh, we'll leave this uh, upper solve intact. But we could change anything we wanted to to any of the other. Uh, Stokes variance up there too. And you can do this as many times as you want. And you don't have to do anything at all to your code. So it looks like that piece of five line code that I showed you before. So uh, this is the kind of experimentation that we want you to do. Look up papers where people make claims, test it easily. Uh, oh. What am I doing? Oh, yeah. So I just show you here exactly is example 62 running all these different things, you know, and you can refine the grid and do all sorts of playing around, which I did. But here is another interesting one that is not Stokes, but is a saddle point problem. And the last one is me doing it. This is Barry. And so this is even more interesting for me because I didn't do it. 
So Barry sent me an email one day and he said, look, this is great. And I said, this is impenetrable. I can't understand what you're doing. So I wanted to break it down for myself. So I know he's solving the Allen Kahn equation. It's got a constant coefficient and, and 2D triangular elements. And so it's a saddle point variational inequality. I won't talk about the variational equality aspect. I'll just talk about solving this thing. And it really doesn't play a big role. So what's going on? You know, he does this big thing and it solves it lightning fast. So what's he doing? OK. So you can run this yourself, too. So first he says, all right, um, let's do multi-grid. Let's do five levels. And let's start with a grid that's 65 by 65. OK, so he gets it up to a grid that is, I don't know, I can't do 65 times 32 in my head. But, you know, something decent. And he's doing FGM res because he expects to do a lot of inexact stuff inside. Um, then he says, OK, uh, let's just use the Galerkin process to compute the coarse grid operators because I don't want to bother rediscretizing. Fine. It's quasi-optimal. And then he says, oh my gosh, Alan Kahn has a null space. So uh, I need to filter out constants somehow. Um, I could you know, go into my code and um, say, oh, I have the constant null space, and make sure it gets passed down to all the levels of multigrid correctly and set in the solvers. And maybe there's an option to do that. Um, but then what if it's only constants on one part of my system? Like if you've got Stokes, you only want constants filtered out of pressure. So you can do all that, and you could pr uh, prescribe it. Or you can just say, oh, you know what? For my course uh, preconditioner, just use SVD, not LU. So that'll get it right. You know, it'll just get rid of the constant mode, and um, you'll, you'll get the right solution. So this is an easy thing that we can do um, that gets rid of a lot of complication in our code. Now, maybe you want to go in and put the null space in later, but just to check, this is really easy. And then he says, OK. Um, now I got to do a smoother for this thing. So what do I do? Um, well, the nice part is it's really easy to design custom smoothers. Because you might expect, you know, SOR is going to fail because this is a saddle point problem. And Chevy Chev's going to be bad because you don't have any kind of eigenbounds. So what do you do? And what we do is we say, oh, well, for the smoother, we're going to use FGM res. We're going to say, I know it's a saddle point problem, so detect the saddle point so I don't have to do anything in my code. And then I'll just use... Uh, two iterates of, of GM res, and I'll do a field split, sure complement, full factorization, diagonal factorization. Okay? Um, so it's just A and S hat, and then uh, it's um, the, oh, the preconditioner is made from the diagonal. So it's A, it's A, S hat, and the, um, the factorization matrices, but the S hat is made from B transpose uh, D of A inverse B, right? So it's a diagonal preconditioner. That's how the preconditioners form, not the action. So he probably runs this, and he's like, OK, this is working OK. But it's a pretty easy, I, I think this problem can run faster, is what he's saying. So he does this, it works, so it doesn't fail with the smoother. And he's like, OK, I'm kind of all right. He says, all right, what am I going to do? The sure complement solver is too expensive. So what I'll do is I'll just run five iterates of GM res with no preconditioner. Because that, um, that sure complement is spectrally equivalent to the identity, and it's actually pretty well conditioned. Um, then he says, OK, that's working OK, but I think I could still speed it up because it's taking a long time to apply the sure complement itself. So what I'm going to do is when I apply the sure complement, I'm just going to use one forward SOR sweep instead of actually inverting A. And so that's going to be an inexact uh, action for the sure complement. So it means I'll have to do some more work on the outer side, but that's what Krelov methods are great at. They're great at cleaning up sloppiness from stuff like this. And so at the end of the day, I have approximated the action of the sure complement, the solve on the sure complement, the smoother. Uh, and I put it all together. And I put an accelerator on the outside and on the smoother to keep it, keep it together. And it's very, very efficient. 
and I could do all of these things stepwise. So for instance, I could, I could have started and said, you know what, um, for this initial smoother, just do LU on the blocks, just exact, and it would do it in one iterate. And then I could say, okay, just do LU on the upper block and do some kind of iteration of the sure complement. And then I could say, okay, back off LU on the top block, um, do, you know, GAMG, or do uh, some Krelov solver, and then I can play around with the sure complement. And you can do this in steps while you say, okay, I'm, my answer's right, and now I'm going to progressively see if I can balance these trade-offs to get it to go faster. And this is the right way to design solvers. So as I said, you can, you can propagate around null spaces um, by attaching them to matrices. And then you know, as they go through solvers, the solver will pull it out and do the right thing with it. Um, but for dynamically created operators, you don't do that, so you have to attach them somewhere else. So we allow you to attach them to the IS, and IS is just a set of numbers, so we allow you to say, oh, this IS is indicating this field, so go ahead and attach this, and it'll get pulled out at the right point. Um, so that was, that was, you know, a quick, you know, kind of introduction to what we call uh, field splitter block solvers. Does anyone have any block solver questions? If not, I'm going to talk about multigrid, which I also love. Okay, so uh, multigrid is great, but a lot of people don't use it because they say, ah, I have an unstructured grid, or I don't want to mess around with creating multiple grids, or it's just too complicated. So you should, at the very least, if you have an elliptic operator, consider trying algebraic multigrid. Now, there are some problems. Um, you know, try it, so we have our own, geometric algebraic multigrid, because it uses some geometry to try and create course modes. But um, there's also ML, which is a wonderful product from Sandia, and Boomer AMG, which is a wonderful product from Livermore. These two are what's called agglomeration multigrid, and this one is classical algebraic multigrid, a little bit different, different strengths and weaknesses. Um, this guy has a larger setup time and uses more memory, but it's just plain better on puts on problems. Um, so these things do have problems, however, with, uh, with, with systems that have vectors, vector character, or systems with strong anisotropy, and none of them have a scalable setup time. So if you measure the full thing, your scalability is going to be really down. But if you ignore it and just, and just look at applications, you can look really scalable, which is what these guys do when they publish papers. Uh, so it's, it's always useful to try these things out. And they can be, I mean, all of these things have been run on enormous problems on big machines and do pretty well. So. Uh, we ha also have support for a geometric multigrid in PETC, where you can say, you know, that's type MG. You can set the number of levels and, you know, V cycles or W cycles, and whether it's additive or multiplicative, um, whether you use the Galerkin um, projection to get the course operators. You uh, can control the smoother on each individual level if you want, and the course problem. And this interface also works with the algebraic packages, like ML and GAMG, and it also works with the unstructured stuff. So for instance, I have unstructured multigrid examples where you use, uh, you take in, you read in a mesh, then you use pragmatic to create coarse uh, approximations to that in a hierarchy, and then you can control the unstructured multigrid with these things. Just, uh, we have really naive, uh, local projection right now, so you could imagine that you could improve that, but you want kind of a operator-dependent projection the way AMG does it, so you want some hybrid, and that's what we we're trying to get at with this, but it's not there yet. Um, so let me just show you examples, because I think if you've never run it before, you have never seen the awesome glory that working multigrid really is, okay? Uh, 
So here's an example. So if you have Petsy on your machine, which at least 50% of you do because we installed it, then you can go to um, the SNES examples. So sort. Now, almost everyone that I saw last night configured with debugging on, which will throw off your timing, uh, but you can do it anyway. Uh, but I would recommend running this again by making another configuration, which is debugging off. Uh, you can run this thing. So what we do is we start on a 21 by 21 structured grid. I'm running all structured grid problems because it's just easier to understand. But these, this all works with unstructured if you want. Uh, we'll solve to 10 to minus 9. Um, we'll refine six times and use four levels of multigrid. So we refine up, and then we come down four levels. You can choose whatever mix you want of that. And uh, this will just show you exactly what solver used. So the default um, smoother is Chebyshev 2 with Jacobi preconditioning, so it's totally linear. Uh, and uh, this problem will have about one and a half million unknowns and eight million non-zeros, because it's only 2D. And you should be able to solve this if you're optimized in a couple of seconds or if you're running debug on my slow machine, it'll solve in under 30 seconds. So what this is, in a matter of seconds, you can be solving problems with one and a half million unknowns. So that should be your expectation, OK? You should not be solving 50,000 unknown problems in like minutes. That's just wrong. Uh, and so this, this is just to give you an idea about what is possible. Say you're doing 3D. So this is, this is a very simple uh, Laplace, it's Brat 2. So it's a nonlinear perturbation of Laplace. This is a real problem. It's an ice sheet. So it is, you know, thin uh, sheet approximation ice sheet, but it has a nonlinear boundary condition. I mean, it's, it's really complex and has been used to write papers. So it has about the same number of unknowns, but you can see about 10 times the number of non-zeros or more uh, because it's 3D and it's got a lot of fill. Um, and we just start, uh, the coarse problem is pretty coarse. Uh, we refine five times. Uh, I changed the matrix type to make it a little more efficient. And um, that's all we have to do. And this thing will run on my laptop in like, I don't know, two or three minutes. Um, but if you're optimized on a new laptop, it should be under a minute, I think. And this is the kind of amazing, amazing performance that you can get out of Multigrid when it works. Uh, and I would consider that when I'm doing new stuff. So if you think that you have to take a thousand iterations of something, I would really question whether that is the truth. I would never do that, honestly. Uh, after 10 iterates, I start getting really nervous. So, I, and, and a lot of people, um, even that run multigrid, uh, I think are unacquainted with full multigrid. So I want to talk a little about it because I think it's underappreciated, okay? Most people, when they think about multigrid, what they think of doing is running a bunch of V cycles and putting them together with a Krelov accelerator. That's a perfectly fine way to do things, but it is usually slower than full multigrid if full multigrid is working. So Krelov accelerators are for the case where multigrid is broken and they fix it. If, you, if it's working, like in these prior examples, then you should do this, full multigrid. So what is it? Full multigrid is the case where I start off on some coarse level, and I solve. And then I interpolate up to the next level. And then I do a v-cycle. And I interpolate up to the next level. And then I do a v-cycle. And then I interpolate up to the next level and do a v-cycle. 
and I keep going until I get as fine as I want. Now, uh, <clears throat> how much work is this compared to the method you're used to? Okay. Um, well, there's a V cycle at the end. So there's at least one times the cost of a V cycle, right? Now, there's this next one down, and let's assume that we got uh, a one-half coarsening rate in each dimension. So I just cut every cell in half to coarsen. Uh, so the next one down takes 1 over 2 to the d uh, cost of this V cycle, and the next one down takes that. So you can do the sum, and it's 2 to the d over 2 to the d minus 1. So in 3D, this is 8 sevenths of CV. So this is about 16% more expensive than just doing one V cycle. So if you do two V cycles with a Krelov method, this is a lot cheaper. So if this is works, um, then you should do this. And in fact, this is only 8 eight seven squared, you know, 64 40 ninths, as expensive as just doing this two-level scheme. So it's amazing the kind of leverage that you get from these multi-level methods. So, you know, I write it down here. In 1D, they don't look great, you know, but in 3D, it's amazing. And so I want to show you an outline of the proof that says that full multigrid converges in one iterate. You know, and I think it's really instructive. So suppose that you have a method that is order alpha. And what do I mean by this? I mean that the discretization is alpha accurate. So if I have the error in my method as a function of h, um, it goes like h to the power alpha. Okay? So for some linear discretization, uh, this would have order two normally. Um, so let's talk about the different kinds of error. What's the difference between discretization error and algebraic error? So discretization error is the error I make by approximating my continuous uh, function by discrete function that will fit on my computer. Algebraic error is the error I make solving my equations with some iterative solver, let's say. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I'll just, it doesn't make sense to solve my equations any more accurately than my discretization, really, because it's just wasted work. It's kind of meaningless accuracy. So what if I say the algebraic error, I'm just going to bound by r times the discretization error, where r is some number less than 1, OK? Then the total error, which I'm going to say is this, the bounded by the sum of these two errors, would just look like this. Now, suppose that I'm just finishing the V cycle for the coarse grid. So I'm just finishing this guy. Let's say I'm over here. Uh, now I'm going to use that as a coarse correction for the next grid up, this guy. And then I'm going to perform the final V cycle here. So I need that the V cycle error reduction factor, eta, uh, on this guy gets me to this R reduction in the algebraic error. That's kind of what I need in order for the whole cycle to work. So the question is, what kind of eta, what kind of, of accuracy or reduction factor in my V cycle do I need in order to get the whole uh, operation to close? So let's take a look. So I need eta algebraic error to be less than R times the order of the method, right? So I can just do this obvious manipulation and get a bound on eta. Um, so what this says is, suppose I stick an alpha is 2 and r is 1 half. So suppose that I solve to, to 1 half discretization error. Then if eta is 1 tenth, then at one iteration of full multigrid, I'm at 1 half, or I'm at total error bounded by um, this. So I get to discretization error in one iterate if eta is less than 0.1 for these values. And the question is, can you get an eta of 0.1 for a V cycle? And the answer is yes. And you can either do it uh, experimentally, where you keep raising the number of smoothing iterates you have until you get 0.1, 
or you can do it, you can look at the theory for the Poisson operator that's in Trottenberg, and he shows you, yes, it's achievable. But it's a pretty simple proof, you know, if it's on one slide, that this works. So does it really work, or was the, just a proof, right? So you can run it. So here we'll use just example five again, and you can use it yourself. So I recently put in method of manufactured solutions into example five. So this uh, is a um, uh, trigonometric uh, manufactured solution for this thing. So it's really easy to see the convergence rate. And I'm just going to refine three times and solve very accurately. And so we see here that V cycles with a Krilov method, it'll be GM res, um, converge pretty well, right? Um, if I change this, uh, uh, well, if I so here I refined three times from the initial grid of like uh, four by four. Uh, if I refine six more times, so it doesn't change the answer much. Still doing pretty well. Um, if I do full multigrid, it doesn't look any faster, right? So this is kind of weird. You know, I have this thing, and then I have full multigrid, and it looks about the same. Like, I, I looked at this myself, and I was like, something's wrong, right? Um, and even if I refine it, it looks almost the same as, you know, what I got with the other guy. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is that I was not at all careful about what my discretization error actually was for any of these problems. And so I was just solving to like 10 to minus 9 every time and not thinking about it, which is what everybody that does numerical linear algebra does. I know, because I do it. And so let's try to help ourselves. So here's a script, here's a Python script, and what does it do? Um, this is just parsing arguments. Uh, what it does is it says, OK, here's some Petsy arguments, and I'm going to stack them all up. And I've just used the subprocess thing in Python, which is really nice, to just run a bunch of examples and suck in the output, which I can then parse, right? So I'll parse. The, so you can see that I'm, I have this output here, which gives me the L2 error and the infinity norm error and stuff, right? And so I just parse that up, and I get the size of the problem. So I just parse that up here. And then I run the V cycle one here and the full multigrid here. Yeah, PCMG type full. And um, then I get matplotlib, which is simply fantastic. And I do a plot of this error. And you can put tech in here. I just love this. And I'll just make this graph. So what does this show? I'm going to do, oh, I, I have to go back to the uh, things. I'm just going to do one iterate uh, here. Uh, I'll, it'll just do one iterate because I'm going to set a really high tolerance. And so what I see is at, when I only do one iterate, here's on the uh, GM res uh, V cycles, I get a convergence rate that is square root of what I expect from my theory. Whereas if I do one iterate of FMG, I'm getting the right convergence. So I am getting discretization error in one iterate with FMG. So what I do is the, the solid line is the data, and the dotted line is the um, uh, theoretical prediction. And what you can see here is probably solver uh, noise, right? Where uh, my algebraic and discretization error are, are close, so it starts wibbling around a little. So what it shows is that, yes, indeed, Full multigrid in one iterate is doing the right thing, and V cycles is not. So for, for a problem like this, you can do full multigrid, get it in one iterate. And notice that if you're on a big machine, this makes an enormous difference, because there is not one reduction in here, unless you want to check it. If you want to check it, you have to calculate the residual, and that's a reduction. But if you don't, if you just believe it, and you just run and get the answer, there's no reductions, right? So um, you'd have to run several iterates here, and that means several reductions for the V cycle. And it's not nearly as efficient as you scale up. So Mark Adams has a great paper where he does M uh, full multigrid for MHD and shows that um, V cycles with the accelerator is about three times slower on the full machine than FMG because reductions are slow. 
Cool. How much time do we have? Like 10 minutes? Oh, until 6. Okay, then I don't have to rush. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions about multigrid? Do you believe me? Did you run it? You shouldn't believe me unless you ran it. I can make whatever pictures I want and just show them to you. You won't know. Okay, so let's talk about time stepping a little because that tends to get left out. And I, oh, yes. Uh, before you talk about multigrid, yeah. you asked uh, if the, the somebody inserting block solvers? Oh, yeah, question about block solvers. Do you have? If you have some time, you can go out. Sure. So block solvers was the first thing that I, that I talked about, the, um, the like field split stuff. Because we split it into blocks, and we solved the blocks individually, and then put them together. Oh, no, block is a little different. Yeah, that's, that's a different thing. Yeah. So let's talk about time stepping. So, Petsy's time stepping used to be really bad, and so I never used it. Um, but uh, Jed Brown and Emil Constantinescu and uh, Peter Brune made it, you know, really usable. Um, they put in lots of neat methods. For people that know about time stepping will know that these are good. But I can tell you the main things that I'm interested in is I'm interested in IMEX methods, so where I kind of use implicit stuff to integrate over the fast wave and then explicitly step other parts of it. And I'm interested in uh, some of these SSP methods. Um, what are SSP methods? Uh, like uh, Dave Ketchison from Kaos works on them a lot. They are methods that say, if you have a stable space scheme, then these are guaranteed to be stable, which is a beautiful property, because usually there's an interplay, and you have, you have to um, constrain your time, st uh, the stability depends on both delta T and delta X, and here we can separate the concerns. So we have a, a new interface for dealing with time-stepping problems. And so this, this is the interface where we say, okay, we have um, a, an implicit function uh, which is a function of time and the solution and its uh, first derivative in time. And there can be an optional um, function that is uh, on the right-hand side that's just a function of uh, time and the solution. So you can specify the right-hand side and you can specify the implicit function and it's Jacobian if you want or we'll compute it. Um, what this allows you to do is this allows you to specify a problem such that um, you could use an IMEX method, because you know what the explicit and implicit parts are. You could use a fully implicit method, and we just dump this into the other side. You could use a fully explicit method, we just dump this onto the other side and put uh, u sub t here. And uh, so we have a lot of flexibility. We have Rosenbrock methods and other things. And so let me show you an example of this. So this is TS example 22, if you want to look in the source. So that means source TS examples tutorials ex22.c. And this is a link, and that'll bring it up in your web browser if you have these open. So let's look at advection reaction. So here's the advection part, and here's the reaction part. So we have a simple boundary condition. And uh, what we're going to do is split it up into an implicit part and then a stiff explicit part, right? So the implicit part. Um, we can just use this DMDA vec get array, like I said, which um, on, an, on a structured grid just makes it really easy to write these expressions. Uh, and we have K, I haven't shown you where K comes from, but K gets passed in. And so we can, we can write something that looks very, very close to this um, code, and it's very simple. And then the Jacobian is not that much harder to write, right? It, so um, it's just, uh, so the, the complication here is that the Jacobian has two parts. It's like DGD solution, and then there's a DGD solution dot, right, part. And what we prescribe is that the way we want you to write the Jacobian is this 
we want dg du plus a dg du dot, OK? And then we give you the a, because of most time-stepping methods, all the ones that we have want a Jacobian of this part with some specified a that, is in, that the solver is in charge of. So here we pass in this a, and then you can see dg d uh, so u dot is just diagonal. So there's an a here and an a here. And then dg du is minus k1, k2, k1, minus k2. So here's k1, minus k2, minus k1, k2. And so it's pretty easy um, to put in. And then for the right-hand side, we'll just give the advection terms. And uh, we could just give advection, but it won't work unless you do some upwinding. So here's some 1D upwinding for the advection stuff, right? But with that, it'll be stable. And um, you can like put in these parameters. And uh, here's the exact solution. And I, or here's the initial solution, so I can just easily code up an initial solution. And this is all in the file. And then I could run these. They make like little pictures and stuff. But I don't know if that's helpful. Uh, you can run them. And like here, it just says draw the solution. And we're, we can use a ROSW type. What you can see is that um, some of these are unstable. And then when I cut the time step down, like this is unstable. And then I cut it down, and it's stable. Or that's unstable, and that's stable. Um, so. You can experiment. It's, it's, it's nice, and we can break it up. So here, you can use an IMAX method because I split it into two parts. So you can use IMAX or RustW, which is a semi-implicit method. Um, we can also do reaction to fusion. So that's not stiff anymore. Uh, so then we could say, well, we're going to use this part implicitly, and we'll do explicit on the, the source terms. And so um, implicit for this is, is just like you'd expect, um, just a regular Laplacian discretization. And then you just have this other term with this is u dot. And the Jacobian is not hard. Um, here, it's just. Um, Diagonal for the uh, parts that have A. So let me find A. Um, this is Jed. Jed writes really compact. Oh, here's the A term, AHX and AHX. So that's diagonal. And then the, um, the off diagonal things uh, are the Laplacian. And the Laplacian's block diagonal because these don't interact, right? So the right-hand side is just this source term. And so it's point-wise. There's no differential operators there. And then we could put in those kind of uh, parameters and then this, this initial data. And we can run. Do you want to, do you want to see, run any of this stuff? I don't know. Is it, can people run this? It's easy to run. Uh, I'm trying to remember why I suggested these. But now I'm curious. So let's do it. It's not hard. Um, I just have to remember where I have my, must be here. It's like, this reorders all of my stupid windows. Yeah, here we go. OK, so I was debugging someone's configure thing. Um, And I'll just make the, I think, does this make the, let's see, options, set default font. And then tell me what you guys can see. Can you see 24? Is this seeable? Yeah. So um, first thing you do is, first thing I do is what's the name of my arch? So I think it's arch master debug. OK, then I can go down into the examples directory. And I can say, OK, Petsy arch equals arch dash master dash debug. And then I can make the example. 
OK. And then I can try running it. Oh, OK. So I play around with stuff. So DYLD. Um, I have specialty stuff built that is not integrated all the way. There we go. So I just have to tell it a library path. OK, cool. Oh, what did I do? Um, it's really hard when you can't see your whole screen. Uh, so it tells you why something failed. And it says, oh, it had diver, uh, divergence for the nonlinear solver. So that's probably why I said. So you can make it slow down by saying, uh, minus draw pause 0 0.2, I think, yeah. So it's drawing the two different um, components of the solution. So you can see it's kind of a wave propagating over here. And then it stops being able to solve it, right? So let me just go back and say, OK. So it was using ROSW there. And so I can change the ROSW type to 2P to make it a little stronger, right? And uh, oh, this is, oh, there we go. Ah. Oh, I got to go up and get that. Need to remember this. I should just set that into my environment variables. So here it, it goes smoothly because I've changed the order of the of the method. So the other one, you know, went unstable. So this is a pretty cool problem actually. Cool. And I wonder what the last thing I did is. The last thing is so same grid, draw the solution. Um, oh, and then you can have it non-adaptive. That's not that much more interesting. So the brusilator thing, you can see, you can get pattern formation and stuff from a pretty simple system that does feedback in the source terms. So it's linear in the implicit part, but you get source feedback and it makes complicated patterns. So we also, so those were like pretty simple, you know, 2D or 3D, or, or I mean, you know, very um, simple time-stepping things without a complicated spatial discretization. So here, in example 11, it's, it's an unstructured grid, uh, finite volume, um, adaptive code that can do advection, shallow water, and oiler, as an example. So let me just play you a video. I think I have the Euler video up. It's like, oh, I know I do. It's kind of a pain. Oh, is that it? Yeah. So here is, uh, well, I, I would like it bigger. Yeah. So here is um, example 11. So example 11, it can do unstructured with DMplex or st uh, structured adaptive with DM forest, and you can just choose that on the command line. So I chose DM forest so that it'll adapt along these things. And then there's a density discontinuity over here on the right. This, this continuity is just the uh, initial pulse. And we just have a pulse coming to the right and hitting that discontinuity. And I think I'm plotting um, density, yeah. So you can see, like, there's refraction and the shot goes through. So we can do, um, you know, nice high Reynolds number shock physics uh, we, with these tools. I mean, certainly this is not a code that I would use to design uh, any engineering things yet. But it has all the ingredients. Um, you can do, so right here I'm doing reconstruction for the finite volume method, 
and this is a, t a totally conservative scheme. Well, it's, it's, it's so-called TVD, <laughs> second order TVD, which is supposed to be impossible, right? But whatever they decide to call TVD, this is. And it's adaptive on the gradient. Now, it would be nice to be able to solve the adjoint problem and use the adjoint solution to adapt this instead of just the gradients. But we're getting to that. This is a little more complicated. But there's some support for that. OK. OK. And so you can run simpler. Like here, I'm just running simpler things like advection. You know, but uh, we can run shell. Uh, oh, here, here are the options that I used to, to run that movie that I showed you. So you say the physics is Euler, and we have grid skew, which makes that density discontinuity. And you say, I want a shock coming in. And you set the CFL and these other Euler parameters. You tell it to use P forest instead of Plex, and what kind of refinement you want. And you say, do uh, least squares reconstruction, but don't compute the gradients for the solution, only for the refinement. Use a min-mod limiter. Um, use SSP uh, so that I know that I get a stable time step given a stable space step. Um, use 10 stages. Uh, do AMR. Um, you know, have refined and co coarse intolerances, and this is all about output. And so, you know, there's complication here, but the underlying code can do a lot of, of simple stuff, too. Um, so, were there any questions about how the time stepping works? OK, so we have some time. So I could talk about how the discretization stuff works, if you guys are interested, because I skipped that, because I didn't know how much time I would have left. Um, we could do a little bit of it. So I just wanted to talk about structured meshes and unstructured meshes. So. The structured mesh support I want to talk about because it's, it's simple and it shows you a lot of the ideas. So we have, an, we have an object we call DM, and that's basically manages all the discretization information. And that it's a big object, and there's arguments, you know, maybe it should be split into smaller objects, but right now it encompasses the topology, the geometry, the discretization space, the equations, kind of. And, uh, but the user is really in charge of that. And the, um, all the hierarchy, too. So how does it work? Well, it knows how to give you members of the space. And it knows how to map between, we, we normally have an idea of two different spaces. We've always had an idea of two different spaces. And these are basically, um, we call them local and global. And Originally, it was just for parallelism. The local space had the ghosts that you share with other processors, and the global space didn't. But then, when I started doing more PDE problems, then I said, oh, well, the local space has unknowns that are constrained by Dirichlet constraints and ghosts, and the global space doesn't. OK, well, that overloading was OK, except if you do something like BDDC, it wants a different local space. It doesn't want the local space that I had. So we had to define a third space that only applies for what the mat is class. So what we'll probably go to is defining a collection of spaces, and they have names, instead of just having global and local. But that's what we have now. So it also knows about geometry. And it knows about the layout of unknowns, which is the main thing I want to talk about. It knows about hierarchy, which I won't get into unless you ask me. And this is just more about hierarchy. So the DM interface is basically uh, some callbacks that you fill up, um, to, or I fill up, to tell the solvers about the discretization. And then um, our solvers, like multigrid, 
use this information uh, to construct the solver, and, but they're basically in charge of control flow. So PCMG gets the projectors, like restriction interpolation, from the DM. It says, okay, how do I get between spaces? And it gets the operators from the DM. And then it organizes it. It says, oh, if it's a V cycle, I'll do this. If it's full multigrid, I'll do this. If it's W, I'll do this. And so it's about organization, not about data. And the DM is basically managing the data. So how does this work for structured meshes? So as I said, DM manages topology and manages geometry. Um, and DMDA is no exception. So uh, it has local callback functions. Form the residual locally, form the Jacobian locally, and then PEDC puts them together. So, you know, the, the kind of cartoon picture for global and local looks like this. Um, and for structured grids, you know, the, the, the lexicographic ordering is this, but in parallel, we transform that to this ordering, which is lexicographic per process. And then when you output, it does a global permutation and puts the vector in the lexicographic ordering for you. That way, output is independent of the number of processors that you ran with. So you can run with 82 processors right to disk and later load it up and run on 71, and there's no problem because it automatically does the permutations for you on input and output. Um, also, these are, these are both global orderings. The local ordering renumbers so that you get a patch that includes the ghost. That way you can write stencil code without caring what's a ghost and what's not a ghost. So, the local function that calculates the residual looks like this. Give me information about my local piece of the grid. Give me uh, a multidimensional array with the uh, input uh, solution guess. And I will output my residual in another multidimensional array. And then you can pass in user information in the context. So here is the Bratu equation, right? So this info says, oh, here's your piece of the grid. Loop over it. And then I will calculate my residual. If I'm on the boundary, and these are global numbers, then just use uh, the diagonal. But if I'm not, form this equation. And so it just looks like a simple stencil code, um, but this will work on any number of processors with any division that's blockwise and stuff like that. So um, this, is the I this is our idea of how you write code. Um, that can be independent. And then, you know, my, my job was to take something like this, which has existed for many years, and turn it into something that will also work this way for unstructured stuff or for structured adaptive stuff. Um, and then the same thing for the Jacobian. What do you do? Except you get a multidimensional array here, but we can't write back into a multi-dimensional array because it's a sparse thing. So what we, we do is we calculate our Jacobian values and then we call matset values stencil. What is that? What is matset values stencil? Okay, so remember matset values And then uh, looks like that. Okay, so it's uh, you input a dense block of values. Now, what's happening here? What's happening here is that uh, it's almost the same, except what are these? These are global indices. Okay. Now, I could just call that, but what I'd have to do is figure out the global index for every point 
every vertex in my structured grid. And people do that. They're like, oh, it's k times the number of components plus j times the number of components, time, you know. And then you, but then you have to worry about, OK, well, there's a local ordering, so transform to the global ordering, then shift it and stuff. So what we have is a thing where instead of putting in integers, we put in a structure that is i, j, k component. So you can see that what I do is I say, OK, row.i is i, row.j is j. And if you don't set the component, it's just 0. You know? And what Matt said value stencil does is it just translates this ijk into a global index and then calls Matt said values. But it just makes the code a little easier to write. Now, I do the same exact trick for unstructured, but I, it's a little more general. I'll do something like this. OK, so what's that doing? I, I don't give, a, I don't give a, a stencil point, ijk. I give a mesh point, like this vertex, or this cell, or this edge, or this face. I just, and they're all numbered, so I just give a number. And then what it does is it says, OK, in the, gri in the grid, I will get the closure of that thing. Then we'll get all the degrees of freedom that live on that closure, and I will line them up. And they will correspond to these values, and I will call mat set values. So when you do finite element code this way, it's like the finite difference. You loop through of the things that you mean. Like for finite elements, I loop through the cells, or I loop through the faces, and then I set all the values on the closure. And just like I set all the values in the stencil here. Oop, sorry. So uh, that's the way the DM is intended to work. It's a layer over top of the basic linear algebra that organizes traversals and organizes indexing. And global to, global to local just allows you to convert from uh, a function in the global space to a function in the local space um, and do it in a way that you can hide the uh, communication. And here, you know, we have different stencils. We have box stencils and star stencils. They just affect the layout. Um, and then I explained, you know, this is what Matt, Matt said value stencil is doing. Um, and then, you know, we have this huge creation function. You can, you, this is the way it used to look. The, I, I wrote in now that you can just do create with a communicator and set all these things individually. DMDA set the dimensions, set the boundary, set the stencil type. But we have one big function if you like to set it all at once. So we can have things like periodic boundaries or ghosted boundaries. We have arbitrary stencil width. You can have an arbitrary number of degrees of freedom at a point, but it has to be the same everywhere for this structured thing. And so there's, you, know, you can run these things, and it will draw the little structured grid and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So this was just debugging, and I want to talk about those. So that's how the structured grid works. I may have a little time to tell you how the unstructured stuff works. So uh, I, this is just the stuff that currently makes me sad, that you cannot effectively compare finite volume and finite element, or even different elements. You know, they ne people never compare different mesh types. Uh, they never compare running different dimensional problems, even though that's probably the right thing to check a lot of times. Um, and so how can we remedy this? Um, well, I, I didn't like the traditional interface because I thought it's a little too general in the fact that it can't tell the solver what it needs in order to do optimal things. I'm only interested in solvers that are scalable. But on the other hand, it's usually too specific in this sense. People want to put everything in the interface. They want to say, oh, if you have a mesh, um, you have to ask for an edge by saying it's a dimension one thing, and it has this shape. So you have to ask for 
quad faces different than pentagon faces, different than pyramids, you know. They all have a different interface for each one of those things. So this is the, oh, what's the name of that? Um, the Department of Energy funds an unstructured grid people under fast math, and they have this kind of interface, and it's crazy in my opinion. Uh, and they do things like this, you know, they have like vertex is a defined thing, so it's different than every other piece of the mesh. And, I, and they have no kind of uh, interface for transitive closure, which is almost always what you want. Either transitive closure in the sense of finite elements where I have the closure of this piece of space, or uh, it's dual uh, in finite volumes, which is the area of influence of a face, right? Same thing. Um, so I think the right thing to do is to represent the mesh as a, as a Haas diagram. And I'll show you what these are. There's a just directed acyclic graphs. And then you separate the topology from the, from the uh, approximation space. And that's really what we want to do. Um, so to give you an idea, here is a Haas diagram representation of this mesh. And in fact, any CW complex is isomorphic to some graph that looks like this. So right here, I've colored the vertices and the edges and the cells different colors, but you can take the uncolored graph and discover the colors efficiently. You can do it in, in ON, and it's really easy. And uh, what the relation is, is covering. So a vertex covers the edges that it's a member of, and an edge uh, covers the face that it's a member of, and so on. And uh, these two things are isomorphic. And in fact, these two things are. And I can discover the middle layer if I need to. Um, and the representation doesn't change if I change to quads. And in fact, you could have a quad and a triangle here, which I should use as an example. And it's the same representation. And none of these points are different than each other. And you can subtract out the middle. You can do it in 3D. Now you can, you, you know, I, I color them in four levels, but it's just a DAG. So you can strip off all the colors, and it's the same DAG. So you don't have to have levels. It's just bigger. And I can subtract out any one of these layers that I want and recreate it. Um, so I have a single relation. I can get the dual by just turning the arrows around. So I can get the dual graph without any kind of computation. Because I have the arrows. I just follow the arrow back up, and I have the dual. Uh, so you don't have to compute the dual. Um, you can, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate functions with these points. And that is our normal idea of functions in the dual space. They're associated with the topology in a sense that everything in the, in the closure of the guy, the dual closure actually, is the domain of influence of the function. So let me show you. So this is described in this paper. But um, none of this would be important. I can represent a whole bunch of crazy meshes and anything you really want to compute on, but it wouldn't be worth it unless I have simple operations that allow me to accomplish things. If all my operations are very specific to what I want to do, it doesn't matter. But it turns out you can do everything you want to do with very simple things. So you can ask, who is everyone that covers me? And we call this operation cone, because that comes, the combinatorial topology had names for these things. And the support would be everything that I cover. So if I have this edge, uh, this vertex 9, I cover all these edges uh, here. And then you can have the transitive closure of these relations. So cone, uh, closure of this thing is, is the transitive closure of the cone thing. So it's, uh, it's everyone um, that covers me. And it's, it's the normal idea of closure uh, that in point set topology. And then the dual of that we'll call star is uh, everyone that I cover transitively. And so this is the I natural idea of the support of a function that's associated with this guy. And you can also have lattice operations like meet and join. Uh, they make sense in this DAG, because it's, it's not just a DAG, it's a poset. 
Um, so basically, what are we doing? We're saying meshes can be thought of as CW complexes, and not, furthermore, function space operations can be encoded by traversals of this graph. That's what we're saying. And it's a small, simple interface. And I can take in a whole bunch of mesh generator things. So uh, let me show you kind of how it works for this Stokes example. So what you do is you ask for things like all of the degrees of freedom on the closure of something. And so I say, give me the closure of this cell from the solution. and you know, I read all those out. Uh, and then I can set the closure or, uh, into a vector or set the closure into the matrix um, when I'm forming the Jacobian or forming the residual. Um, and all those are built on this get transitive closure, which is easy. And the same interface works for structured adaptive that it works for unstructured. So that's how I can use PForest and stuff. Uh, and do those things. So I'll just remind you. So DMs, they do discretization and decomposition and hierarchy. And all that stuff that works in structured world works in the unstructured world, too. So we can do unstructured partitioning and, and rebalancing and partitioning of everything automatically. And we don't have a specific thing. So I don't write specific code to do one kind of rebalancing. <laughs> so the code that partitions the mesh is the same code that uh, redistributes the coordinates. It's the same code that redistributes the solution. It's the same code that redistributes the matrix. All of the things, uh, because everybody works on this graph representation where I don't care what the points are. Um, so let me try to explain. So we wanted to separate the, the, top, the topology from the representation of the data or the function space. And so Petsy originally had this thing, Petsy layout. And what it did is it said, the vector has a certain size on each process. So really, what that is, is a specification of the original global space as a direct sum, right? So it just says that my original space H is equal to a direct sum of all these HPs on every process, right? Uh, really simple. Um, so we can take that farther. Uh, what we can do is we can say that our space, our discrete space, is a direct sum of little spaces associated with each of the vertices or each of the edges and vertices. And this is exactly how PDE people talk, except they say fiber bundle. That's a fiber bundle. There's a fiber associated with each point in that base space, which is the mesh. And so that's what we do. So we generalize this idea of a layout. Layout just had um, a size for every processor. Now we're going to say, well, you, instead of processor, let's just generalize it to any point. We'll call them points. So we have points in the mesh, and each one of them can have degrees of freedom. And then we will say, OK, there are three degrees of freedom here, two here, and five here. And that is enough information for us to do layout, to do adjacency computations uh, for matrices, to do anything you want as far as the solver goes, because the solver doesn't have to know anything about the analytics. And so what it does is it decouples the mesh from the discretization, because the mesh handles traversal, but the de discretization is just handling sizes. And so they don't have to, you can substitute a new discretization on the same mesh or a new mesh with the same discretization, and it works OK. Um, it decouples the mesh from the solver, because now the solver doesn't have to care about topology at all. It just really cares about sizes and partitions, and this information is in there. And it decouples the discretization from the solver, because now you just talk through this object that understands sizes. So imagine something like this. We have this object which just says, um, how many degrees of freedom are there per dimensional object? This is a simple way of thinking about it. And this gets translated into the full offset structure. So like three degrees of freedom on every, uh, on every vertex here, and uh, every one degree of freedom on every cell, three degrees of freedom on every vertex, face, edge, 
uh, cell and, and one degree of freedom per vertex here. So it's easy to specify these kinds of discretizations in this language. And then we can create this at a low level, and this is what it looks like for Stokes, you know. Um, and then when you ask for the closure, you get something like this. Except then we reorder it to segregate by field. So you can easily use it. And this is the last thing I'll show, but I think this is the real power of this stuff, is that if you have that kind of information, you can use um, the information about what's shared to kind of push up. So let me give you an example. Suppose you had a section where you said, OK, the points are processes, and the degrees of freedom are mesh points. So this is a partition. Which process has which set of mesh points? So I have uh, some section object that tells me that. And then if I, have, if I know my process neighbors, then I can push up and get shared points out of those two. And then uh, if I then said, oh, well, let the point space be mesh points, and then let the degree of freedom space be mesh points, then what you have is a topology, which mesh points are covered by other ones. And topology plus shared points gets shared topology. So you can push up from distributing the points to distributing the adjacency. And it's the same code. The same code for this arrow does this arrow. And then if you have, again, mesh points, but then the degree of freedom space is how many solution degrees of freedom for each mesh point, then that's the data layout. With the shared points, you can push up shared degrees of freedom. So that's adjacency for the solution space, not for the topology. Same code. Every up arrow is the same code. Nothing changes. And you can get, this is shared degrees of freedom. Then you could get shared adjacency for the Jacobian, which is um, you know, one layer out or k layers out, same code. So this is, the abstraction is really working for you here because you don't write separate code for di different dimensions. You don't write separate code for different cell shapes. You don't write separate code for different discretizations. You don't write separate code to communicate different kinds of things because the communication is all based on what the adjacency structure is, and that adjacency structure is encoded in the DAG, and so everything works when you turn the crank. OK, that's it. I have a lot of slides on forming residuals, but we don't have time. So I think we'll end. OK, so let's thank Matt for the tutorial. <laughs>